Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 30th meeting, 13th meeting of 2018. It just feels like the 30th Sundays. Apologies have been received from Liam, Car uh, Liam MacArthur and Tavish Scott will be joining us as his replacement shortly, I hope. Agenda item one is a decision on taking item three in private, which is consideration of the committee's forward work programme. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. And agenda item two is an evidence session on the proposed integration of the British Transport Police in Scotland into Police Scotland. I refer members to paper one, which is noted by the clerk, and paper two, which is a private paper. There are two panels of witnesses today, and I welcome the first panel, Chief Constable Paul Crowther, British Transport Police, Nigel Goodband, National Chairman, British Transport Police Federation, Tom McMahon, Director of Business Integration Police Scotland, and Callum Steele, General Secretary of the Scottish Police Federation. Can I thank all the panellists for their written submissions, which are always immensely helpful to the committee prior to us taking questions. Before I go to questions from all the members, I want to pose one question to all the panellists to begin with. Given that full integration has not yet started, um, and given the escalating costs and yet uncautified and the risks identified, uh, do the panellists consider the suggestion by Kath Murray in her submission that option two should be looked at and considered? That's the option for a commissioned service fully integrated option should be looked at at this stage and um, I we think generally be taken. So can I go, go around the panellists and ask their views? Who'd like to start? Mr Goodman. Convener, um, firstly, thank you very much for uh, yourself and your colleagues of the Justice Committee for allowing us the opportunity to attend today and provide evidence regarding the integration. As you will undoubtedly be aware, we have suggested that the welcome pause is the right time to look at any alternatives and look at any benefits and disbenefits of any alternatives. So we would encourage the Scottish Government to, and the Joint Programme Board to give consideration to a commission service type model. Um, we think it's important that now, knowing more detail than what was originally known at the beginning of um, the proposed plan, that that detail should be taken, it should be reassessed, re-evaluated, and it should be compared to any alternative um, methods of achieve, achieving devolution. Because I can reassure um, the Justice Committee that the British Transport Police Federation stance is not against devolution. It's simply that we don't <coughs> believe that full integration is the answer to achieve that. Okay, thank you. Mr. Crawford? Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, so I think uh, the British Transport Police and the British Transport Police Authority have submitted um, papers in the past uh, as this debate has continued for some time. Uh, I think uh, my position must be that the, um, uh, the Smith Commission recommendation, which was then converted into, uh, into law within the, the, the Scotland Act, um, conveys on the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Government, the decision around um, how the functions of the British Transport Police will be uh, devolved. And um, I think it's a matter for the Scottish Government to decide how that is carried out. Um, there are clearly options that people have put forward, but I think that is for um, the Government to decide how they intend to take that um, devolution forward. Mr McMahon. Thank you, Convener. Our Police Scotland's simple position is that we respect the will of this Parliament. We work through the Joint Programme Board, um, which has overseen the development of the legislation to move towards full integration. We respect that. That's the basis on which we are progressing. Okay. And Mr Steele. Yeah, thank you, Convener. The SPF position would be similar to that of Mr Crowder and Mr McMahon. It's quite simple. We have to respect the will of Parliament. That's helpful. We now move to detailed questions, starting with... Oh, sorry, there's a supplementary from Ronia Denmari. Thank you, Convener. Um, yes, it was just 
on what you were saying. Mr Goodband, I wonder if I could ask you if you've been in contact with the UK Government about the Conservative Manifesto pledge to um, integrate BTP in an infrastructure um, policing model. I have indeed um, been party to discussions uh, with the Home Office and civil servants within the Home Office regarding infrastructure. And the last uh, instruction we got was that infrastructure policing was not being considered by the UK government currently because of other um, priorities. I have since made some inquiries because, as we all know, that it did appear within the Conservative Party manifesto. But as quickly as it appeared, it also uh, was removed from the final draft that went to the Queen's speech. And I'm informed that there is no work being conducted by um, the UK government towards infrastructure policing. And it was quite uh, alarming to hear Mr Matheson in the Scottish Parliament suggesting that it is the Conservatives uh, Party's will to abolish British Transport Police. Even if infrastructure policing was indeed on the table, it was never to abolish the British Transport Police. It was to merge three forces and to enhance a national policing service that was going to be suggested. And BTP were going to remain the, the force that policed the railway infrastructure. So it was, there was never, even in the suggested plan, um, was there a proposal to abolish British Transport Police. That's my personal understanding of what we were being informed by the Home Office. But since that meeting, we have been told there are no plans currently to look at infrastructure policing within the UK government. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. Manny? Thank you. It was just in relation to the convener's first question, and probably particularly to Mr Goodband and to Mr Crowther as well, in terms of your initial responses, because we did have the debate before about options and uh, we consulted on the bill that was being put forward and the Parliament then supported full integration. So that's the decision that's already been taken. So do you not think that rather than using the time to... I know that the date has been delayed for the full integration because a number of issues have been uh, ha have risen during that time. But sh surely the time should be spent, rather than looking at alternatives, to actually try and iron out those problems that have been identified. And I think that it concerns me that in your initial response that that's how you think the time should be spent when, as I say, the Parliament has taken that decision and that's how the Parliament has decided to move this forward. And I think that there are a number of important issues that have been identified, and I think that that time needs to be spent trying to iron that out so that this transition is as smooth as possible. I, I, I totally accept. Um, however, from our perspective, we, we see um, that the reason for pause was that there was um, the view that an effective and safe um, integration could not be achieved by April 2019. So if there's a concern around risk and safety to the public, then is it the um, Scottish Government's will to try and manage those risks and continue with the high level of costs to try and achieve full integration? Or is it an opportunity? I'm not suggesting for one moment full integration should be totally ignored but to look at an alternative to see if devolution can be achieved in any other way other than full integration that may indeed eliminate some of the risks that have been identified by the MTT and the Joint Programme Board. George, you wanted to come in for a supplementary? Yes, yeah, just a quick supplementary, uh, conveners. Just uh, to Mr Goodband, when you said that the, the Tory manifesto had that in it initially, and incidentally the Scottish Tory manifesto had that in it as well, so it might have been cut and paste uh, onto that as well. But one of the things that you said is you believe that the UK government aren't moving towards it because it wasn't in the Queen's speech, but there's quite a lot of manifesto that wasn't in the Queen's speech. So if I was you, I'd be thinking there might be something else there. But... The other point you said as well was the merger of the three services. The original idea was the BTP was going to be just business as usual, even if they did merge the three services. Surely that's hugely naive. Well, I, wouldn't, I didn't use the term business as usual. I used the term that the British Transport Police will remain with the responsibility of 
um, policing the railway infrastructure and the expertise and the specialism. So the service we, would obviously change? But the service would change, yes, between that we, we wouldn't be called three different forces. We would, in essence, we were told that the new name was potentially the infrastructure, the National Infrastructure Police Force. Um, but we were, within the plan, were suggesting that the officers, the specialism uh, and the experience of British Transport Police will remain within the infrastructure of the railway. To me, it sounds very similar to the Scottish Government's idea of Police Scotland. Well, no, because what's happening with the national infrastructure is that it was to have a national uh, police force throughout the country, in England, and Wales and Scotland. What I um, believe that the Scottish um, Government's will is, is to dismantle um, British Transport Police in its current form. But keep the create, expertise, but keep the expertise as you said. Well, create a national force within Scotland and alone. keep the expertise. Within Scotland, yes. Yeah. Um, we've got a uh, first set of questions from Daniel. I believe you also have a supplementary, Daniel. So just following on from, from that last line of questioning, uh, is my understanding that the delay to the integration programme was put in place um, and in the words of, of not just, your, your, uh, not just the, the, the Federation, but indeed Police Scotland, was that it was arising from public safety, that it, it couldn't be achieved on that date uh, safely. I was just wondering maybe if members of the panel could maybe just bring to life a little bit specifically what those safety concerns might be and what, what the risks um, were, you know, were that, that caused the delay. I was just wondering if you could give a description of that. Well, I can only comment on um, my position from a staff association mm -hmm. and our concern around the loss of um, specialist railway policing <laughs> skills and expertise. I've already commented within um, this uh, committee that there was a fear that a number of officers would leave British Transport Police if they were forced to transfer over to Police Scotland because of the um, fear around financial detriment, particularly with pensions. Um, we're now already seeing that those officers are indeed leaving. We've had, in the region of 51 officers over the last three years that have left, we've had um, 20 officers and staff leave in the, eight, the last eight months since Royal Ascent has been achieved. And 70% of those that have left have cited the merger as the reason for them leaving. So if that expertise and that experience is leaving, then to suggest that non-experienced police officers, and I'm not decrying the services of Police Scotland because they provide an excellent service in the jurisdiction that they police currently, but they have no knowledge and no experience of policing what is a dangerous environment, and to suggest that they will come onto the railway infrastructure and provide an enhanced level of policing service is somewhat naive and misleading. Um, and I would suggest that without that ex expertise, without that experience, that potentially could cause um, problems with public safety because one misunderstanding, one miscommunications could create a fatality. And one fatality is one too many simply because of a, a misunderstanding. And, and that's why we have concerns. Okay. Can, can I just quickly ask the other members of the panel if they'd agree with that characterisation of, of, of the risk that needs to be uh, addressed if, before integration proceeds? Um, <clears throat> so I, I think um, so. Nigel makes points around uh, the, the um, retention of staff, which I think is a is a significant issue. Um, the primary issue around safety from my perspective in terms of uh, the decision to pause related to um, command and control systems and information uh, technology. So uh, in the latter half of last year, a proposal emerged that there would be uh, a partial integration rather than full integration. Well, um, we've been working exclusively on a full integration model. Uh, nothing, nothing less. And uh, what we uh, were very concerned about, uh, and I think Police Scotland shared our concerns, as we delved into the realities of command and control and managing incidents with disparate IT systems within Police Scotland, that that posed 
a safety risk. So uh, railway policing is a national function. At the moment, it's a GB national function. Under the proposals, it will be a Scotland national function, and it has to be managed in a national way. So that means the command and control structures need to look at it on a national, uh, from a nat national perspective. Uh, the way crimes are recorded, the way incidents are looked at to look at repeat victims need to be look at, looked at at a national level. Um, uh, currently, Police Scotland IT systems don't enable that to happen. And so the suggestion was that BTP would uh, provide IT systems to enable that to happen. But actually, when you delve into the detail of that and the connection between Police Scotland command and control system, for example, a system called Storm, and our command and control system, a system called uh, Control Works, uh, and ours is integrated with all the systems within BTP and Storm isn't, it presents some significant risks that you would miss vulnerable victims, you would miss repeat victims, or indeed the systems by which are absolutely necessary to communicate with drivers of trains and the important infrastructure within the railway could not be guaranteed within the Police, uh, Police Scotland ICT systems as they currently are. So that led me and others to the view that uh, until such time as the IT systems within Police Scotland can deal with that, it would be unsafe to proceed. Okay, that's useful. I mean, Mr McMahon, would you agree with that characterisation of, of, of the, the risk? I would emphasise that the conclusion that we reached in February, that April 2019 was unachievable, was yes. a shared view. Yes. Um, both the, the Chief and uh, Mr Goodband have given some flavour of that. I think it's important to refer to uh, what's in the submission to the committee that Police Scotland's risk appetite around this work is low. Yes. This is, and what's been legislated for, is a standalone railway policing function. We are ready to set that up. When we stood up the MTT that I referred to in my submission, we looked in some detail across the work streams um, and assessed just how much further work required to be undertaken. Um, what became clear, and it was a shared conclusion, was that we would have to develop systems and the proper integration of those in partnership, that insufficient progress had been made towards that, and that actually, bearing in mind the low risk appetite, it would not be sensible to progress on the basis of April 2019. And that became an immediate issue because as of April 2018, the BTPA were proposing to um, cease contracts and so on and to um, progress their strategy to make clear that they would have no further functions within Scotland. So in light of that context, our view was more time was needed, more effort needed to be put jointly into the, the work it had to be properly programme managed. We had brought a strong element of that through the MTT that needed to be stepped up. We needed to dedicate sufficiently mo more resources to do the work. I don't think any of the issues that have been highlighted though are insurmountable. Okay. I think it just requires more time to get it right. Understood. Um, there's a couple of supplement supplementaries on that safety issue. John Finney and Liam Clare. Well, it actually was on the, the issue of staff numbers, if I may, that Mr. Um, do we manager. cover that later? If not, then by no, all means, ask mentioned. it now, Mr. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Goodman, in relation to, to the numbers that you quoted there, what's the natural turnover of your members? Because you will, you know, there's normally a, an expected percentage. What's the natural turnover? And all, all of these people who do leave, you know, who left in, in previous years, would have been replaced by people who would have to be trained up as. The information I've received um, in relation to BTP Scotland is that, on average, it's um, 13 officers per year. Um, since Royal Ascent, it's equated to potentially 21 officers per year. So there is an increase. <clears throat> okay, thank you. And Liam Kim. If I may, the, the, the longer the time taken, one would theorise, the longer the time taken to put this through, the more perhaps disruptive it will be, the more impact there might be on morale, the more likely it might be that people will leave and not transfer across. So can I ask Police Scotland, what do you plan to do if, whenever the transfer date is, uh, there simply aren't enough people to transfer over to resource the function? Where will the resource come from? We're confident that we can dedicate the resources across more than 17,000 police officers and with a positive partnership in the replan period, and a journey towards full integration. 
We're confident we can scale up our people. The training needs analysis that I know this committee took an interest in previously has been undertaken. Um, again, much will rely on partnership. We are moving towards a model that is standalone for Police Scotland, but we recognise that the journey towards that will have to be based on continued partnership. And the working relationships with our BTP and BTPA colleagues is very positive. So Excuse that me. in itself underpinned the commitment to a replan. It was a joint conclusion and an acknowledgement that better joint working had to be progressed. Forgive me, Tom, I didn't quite understand that. What you are saying, just to be absolutely clear, if there are not enough people transfer across from the BTP uh, at, at the point of uh, transfer, uh, the Police Scotland will draw people in from other departments, badge them up and train them, uh, and assign them as BTP officers. Is that correct? Well, I, I would expect there to be a period of shadow running. We would need this part of a strategic workforce plan to assess what the likely drop-off was in terms of legacy BTP officers in D Division. You know, this is day-to-day -day business for Police Scotland that we will plan the workforce, we look at where resources are currently allocated, what likely retirement dates are and so forth. Um, so I would be confident that we would deliver a plan that would enable us to ensure that staffing levels were maintained. And that's obviously what the, the rail industry itself would expect. Thank, thank you, convener. And it's, it's actually on this people element of it that the SPF has got the greatest interest. Uh, up, up till now, uh, our involvement has been remarkably limited uh, for a whole variety of understandable reasons, not least amongst them that BTP officers aren't our members. Uh, and <clears throat> I think that whilst the issues of uh, the, the merger or the takeover, depending on which particular side of the fence you're sitting on, uh, have uh, been developed so far, they tended to ignore the human part of it, which I think is the element that cause, causes the greatest interest to myself and particularly Nigel at the end of the table. But on, on Mr. MacArthur's, uh, sorry, Mr. Kerr's question specifically, uh, I, I, I don't see this as being a particularly difficult issue, not least because I don't think for a minute that Mr. Crowther will allow the BTP in Scotland to have diminished number of police officers up to the date that they transfer into Scotland uh, and at the appointed day where they transfer over there have already been assurances from the service that they will come into an integrated transport division within Police Scotland. So the number of police officers on the appointed day uh, will have been in BTP in Scotland on the day before and they will be in the transport division of Police Scotland on the day after or on the day and the day after. So that particular element of how many are going to transfer over I think will be dealt with by the British Transport Police uh, service in its own right and that it will not, unless Mr Crowther is going to disabuse me of my notion, uh, that it will not allow uh, an unacceptably low level of police officers to be available to deliver a policing function in Scotland. Uh, so I, I think that uh, whilst I can understand the concerns about the options, the simple fact is the legislation makes clear that on one day you're going to be in the BTP and the next day you're going to be in police Scotland. So I don't think it's uh, as much an issue as the reality would bear out. Ms Crowther? Um, uh, I, I don't disagree in uh, the, the, if you like, the totality of what's been said. I think there are some practical uh, issues that we'd work through. We've got a very close working relationship as we uh, approach the date of integration. So I'm, I will be responsible for policing uh, the railways in Scotland until, until the day that um, the Chief Constable of Police Scotland takes over, and I need to make sure that's effective. Um, uh, I have quite an interesting challenge ahead because it, it's true to say there are some people within D Division and BTP who wish to transfer to the England and Wales part of BTP. Um, I, I, whilst maintaining a service, I would want to see how I could work with colleagues to make, make sure that um, we, uh, we looked after everybody's interests. There will come a time when um, it would probably be impractical, indeed probably improper, to recruit new British Transport Police officers when actually they should be Police Scotland officers who are then seconded to, to British Transport Police to work in transition and start to build up. That would probably be uh, the most sensible way of uh, approaching things nearer the time. The, so in terms of numbers, I don't think numbers are the issue. They're, they're with the right number on the day that transfer over. The issue for me is more around skills and expertise and, and outlook. So um, Nigel sort of uh, highlighted, and, and, and all of these things we'll work with. I'm, I'm, I'm not shroud-waving or anything like that. I'm just sort of talking through some of the practicalities. 
Nigel's talked about sort of normal turnover and a slightly accelerated turnover uh, that, that, that we've seen. Um, there's the reality of how many people will retire between now and whenever the date will be. So for, if, for example, there were a two-year um, uh, uh, period, then um, there are around 54 people who reach the age of 50 who could retire, who could retire. And uh, when you look at what that looks like in the spread of resources, there are about 30% of constables, 25% of sergeants, 50% of inspectors, and all the chief inspectors could retire in that, in that period. Um, Mr McBride, the chief superintendent, retires later this year. So the challenge for me is how I maintain the specialism and the, um, the specialist focus that's present in BTP officers, which I think is the thing that we've been saying all along is the most difficult thing to replicate. And um, so numbers will transfer over. The task that we've all got is making sure that the people who end up policing the railway uh, going forward have got the skills, uh, attributes and attitudes that are needed for that specialist policing function. Thank you. Uh, Daniel? So I'd, I'd like to look at actually how this programme is, is being managed, and in particular, um, one of the sort of latest developments has been um, the introduction of Ernst and Young to head up the, the, the PMO. Now, can I ask, is, has the MTT been disbanded and replaced by the PMO? Does it still exist? And how does the governance around that this PMO function actually works? I, I noticed in our briefing note it describes ENY. Uh, being a member of of that, along with Police Scotland, BTP, BTPA, and Scottish Government, and that, that sounds like a bit of a mix of kind of function and, and governance. And I, I just like some clarification around how it all fits together. A number of positive discussions with Scottish Government. We support the move um, for the overall programme within which we sit um, to effectively stand its height to set up a fit for purpose PMO. The MTT served a purpose. It brought both sides, in terms of Police Scotland and BTP, together effectively. We came to, I think, a solid conclusion in terms of April 2019. In terms of the roles within the PMO going forward, I, I don't want to preempt the um, evidence that you'll hear in the next session. The Scottish Government have appointed a programme director who will lead the PMO. That's not an EY person. EY were already involved due to a contract that we had signed alongside BTPA with uh, the MTT's programme governance. So we have suggested that the PMO, uh, working underneath the Scottish Government's programme director, would benefit from EY's input. But I would defer to the, um, the, the SRO, Donna Bell, to explain to you in a bit more detail as to how that will work. Uh, and can I just ask, what, what's the the scope and, and remit of their work? I mean, does it extend to formulating a, a business case, for example? Not as far as I'm aware. The purpose of the, the PMO um, is to oversee the journey towards full integration, to lead the work on the replan, um, and to address the weaknesses that were identified and called out in February, uh, some of which related, as we've talked about, to staff engagement and so on. So we, we look to support the work that the, the PMO will, will lead in that space. So, so does it reflect then a, a lack of um, the required expertise in terms of integration planning and engagement? Um, is that why E and Y were brought in? Well, our, our view at the point that the MTT stood up, if you recall, it was based on advice, and I've said this in my submission, from HMICS. We were given notice uh, late last summer that they felt that internal governance within Police Scotland, um, in terms of the gold group that ACC Higgins had convened, should move across and become a more formalised uh, programmatic structure. So we took that on board. HMI also advised us that we should work more closely with BTP counterparts. Um, <coughs> I was brought into this, this role um, in August of last year. So the first task was to take that advice, stand up the MTT programme and take a realistic, clear-eyed view as to the deliverability of April 2019. And as well as that, obviously, put, you know, reorganise work streams and put sufficient resources behind them. What we acknowledged, as I've said, in February was that needed more time. 
I mean, I guess my concern here is, is if, if Ernst & Young are being brought in because there weren't sufficient skills and expertise to deliver a transformation programme, an integration programme, such as it was, I mean, what level of confidence um, do you have that you'll be able to continue that integration programme at, you know, beyond the point of, of, of transfer? Um, it, it just, I think it begs a certain question. I'm, I'm, I'm confident that with continued specialist help we're required, and again, I would look to the, the PMO to brief you on their views around that. Um, the work can be taken forward. I would, again, I would refer to evidence that was provided to the committee around the creation of Police Scotland. I recognise this is different. It's more specialist. It's a different skill set. We absolutely recognise that. We know there are different um, processes we will have to go through to make sure that Police Scotland has the capability. But I'm confident that we have the ability to integrate what is D Division at the moment and create Railway Policing Division, Police Scotland. So just on that, that question of integration, has the integration of all the legacy ICT systems concluded in Police Scotland then? No, that's, that's work that's still ongoing. So it's, it's still underway. So, so five years on from the creation of Police Scotland, the legacy systems and ICT systems are still unintegrated, and yet you're, you're contemplating integrating yet another system in a very different form of policing and, and, and you're confident you can do that. I'm just wondering why your experience of police, the integration of Police Scotland leads you to that conclusion. There is a member asking um, specific questions about that, Daniel. You have had a fair shot, but if you could answer very briefly. I, I would only refer, you know, Police Scotland 24-7, 365 days a year, effectively Police Scotland keeps people safe. I'm we're, not we're confident. That. We're confident that... Yes, there are legacy systems. We've had played out in the Parliament around the I6 failure and so on. That's being addressed. We're developing our ICT strategy, uh, work around core systems and so on, which I can come on to speak about. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Police Scotland and British Transport Police Authority chaired the MTT board. Could you confirm who's the accountable officer for the work of the Programme Management Office? Well, the work of the Programme Management Office will report to the SRO, and that's a shared role between uh, Dan Moore and Donna Bell. So they are the accountable officers? They, they'll, they'll be accountable, yes. Okay. Does the new arrangement uh, provide for sufficient, uh, a sufficient level of independent governance and financial oversight, in your view? I think as part of the replan, we would look to um, consider options around what assurance we seek about the policing model that we seek to stand up. Okay, Maurice Corey. Good morning, gentlemen. Have any of the lead organisations um, for the joint uh, programme board projects changed? Um, not, not to my knowledge. Again, the, the opportunity the replan gives us is to review that. Are you looking to make changes in your work as a director? No, I mean, we, we want to work within the, the framework that the PMO will, will sit on top of. All right. Okay. Um, <coughs> Police Scotland's indicated that in, in its submission um, that uh, it has, there's now been a, a, an accountable officer with delegated strategic responsibility for all aspects of uh, uh, railways policing integration in, in uh, Police Scotland. Um, ca can the panel tell me um, who that might be? Well, I, I should clarify that the submission I made to Parliament called out that the SPA last summer asked Police Scotland, effectively delegated to David Page, who's my boss, Deputy Chief Officer, um, to oversee all aspects of railway policing integration. That's what prompted, along with the HMI recommendations, the establishment of the MTT. Um, so th there will be, obviously, uh, operational accountability. That will sit with ACC Mark Williams on the Police Scotland mm -hmm. side. Um, and our engagement um, at the Joint Programme Board effectively gives us a a level of shared accountability. Right, okay. Any other comments from anybody? Right, thank you, Kavina. Right, no. No. Ben. Kavina, good morning, panel. I have a number of questions to a point that was raised earlier, which is around the pension situation of the integration that's, that's taking place. Uh, first of all, Mr McCann, I just wondered if you could update me as to the the progress in terms of the proposition from the Scottish Government to uh, put, a, 
put the relevant uh, scheme members into uh, a separate pot of the uh, BTP for superannuation fund and just give me an, an indication as to progress on, on that point. Yes, the, the proposal that a segregated fund be established um, has progressed to the point where SPA, through their accountable officer, Kenneth Hogg, have written to the Scottish Government um, looking for what's technically biased, I think, is the employer's covenant. It's just effectively seeking indemnification for any future liabilities that may arise around the, the fund. Sure. And uh, so progress is be being made on that and setting up that new defined benefit scheme for the, the relevant scheme members. Well, we're, we're certainly in, in regular contact with the, the trustees. I mean, at the moment, we await the response from Scottish Government around indemnification. Okay, thank you. And um, Mr Goodman, you raised a number of points uh, about uh, pensions in your, your submission. I noticed you uh, highlight that you have uh, some concerns in, in, in your view about the, the financial impact on officers serving in the BTP and officers serving elsewhere in, in the UK around the fund. Um, you, you state some points about anxiety and emotional impact, which are obviously quite quite nebulous. But w what I'm interested in is, is the evidence, because we know from actuarial advice in 2017 that this is a fully funded scheme, which is a healthy and, a, and positive uh, scenario, and that the, the pension liabilities of 97 million are balanced by about 99 million of pension fund assets. So I know you're on the management committee for the scheme, so perhaps you can talk about the health of the scheme. It just seems to be a discord between the health of the scheme and the concerns that you're raising. Yeah, I can, uh, clarify the position. The, the scheme is indeed a healthy scheme. It, it sits at 102% in that if everything all went wrong, every member could be paid. Um, what is being proposed is that some of those assets, and I don't know the figures that you've quoted of 99 million, I'm not sure where those figures uh, have come from. We personally haven't seen any advice uh, from the actuaries. We have been in contact with the trustees of um, our pension scheme and they don't recognise those figures themselves. And I'm sure Mr McMahon could update you with regards to what advice um, Police Scotland and the Scottish Police Authority have had on that. But from our perspective, we're not sure what the proposal is actually um, suggesting because there's officers that are going to be currently serving members, but it's a closed scheme. As they retire, that membership will reduce. And in the proposal itself, there's an acknowledgement that the contributions could increase because of the uh, age of the membership. But isn't that the case with every pension scheme, though? Well, no, because ours is not a closed scheme. Ours is an well, open every scheme and scheme. will continue yeah. to be open whilst officers join British Transport Police. In this proposal, it's a closed scheme and no new members who are going to be um, Scottish Police or Police Scotland Railway Division can join this scheme. So the membership will fade away. The contributions will increase, undoubtedly, but the liabilities within the proposal, there is no um, suggestion who is going to cover the liabilities. Now, to suggest that £99 million from a current pension scheme, which the Scottish Government, to be frank, haven't paid one penny into, but can suggest that they can come along and take £99 million from a scheme and put it into a segregated scheme is something that I don't fully understand but, and nor but, do but my aren't members. But they, aren't they the liabilities for active BTP officers based in Scotland? So if there was a separate defined benefit scheme being created for active BTP officers based in Scotland, surely it would be right and proper for those assets to then pass into such a new scheme? Well, that, that's the question, Mark, that we, we, we would have to seek legal advice on because this is being, um, in a way, forced upon a scheme that, um, that the members don't want. The members do not want to transfer into a 
um, close segregated scheme because it weakens, that pot will be weakened in comparison to the main pot. The, what will have to be taken with the assets will be the retired officers that ultimately have already paid into to the scheme. Who identifies those retired officers? Because there's officers who are from Scotland um, and proud Scots who served in England but now are retired and reside in Scotland. Do they become part of that, uh, those assets in the segregated pot? There's also officers that are, live in England and have retired in England but served in Scotland. So there's confusion about how these assets are going to be simply picked out of our main scheme and transferred into a segregated scheme. Can, firstly, can it be done legally? Is, that, is, the, is it lawful to do that? And secondly, who has actually agreed these £99 million worth of assets that that's the value? Because we haven't seen that advice. The trustees themselves haven't seen that. I've had confirmation of that only this week. Because when Mr Matheson did mention the 99 million, but I can reassure you, the members of the British Transport Police Federation are on the phone to me saying, are they suggesting that they're going to take some assets out of our main pot? Or does that impact on officers in England and Wales? And I'm saying, well, I don't know, because I've not seen this advice, nor am I a lawyer, uh, unfortunately. But, it, but, but if it's a fully funded... Um scheme that's 102%, I think you said earlier? Yes. So surely it would be in, in the interest of both parties if under the agreement based on the democratic decision of this parliament for, uh, and then f f following negotiations in terms of taking the scheme forward to make sure that members, uh, your, the members of the scheme employees, when this transition takes place, surely it would be in everyone's benefit for negotiations to take place in a constructive manner to make sure that those, li uh, that those assets that are relevant to Scottish scheme, uh, scheme members pass in order to make sure that that scheme is healthy. And also, uh, in terms of keeping... Well, it's, it's a complicated matter. I'm yeah. trying to, 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 to get to this point because I think it's extremely important that going forward, in order to make sure that the agreement that is made, that those members who are transferring continue to benefit from the pensions that they deserve, that everyone approaches that in a constructive manner and the assets that apply to Scotland should surely be passed to Scotland. And I don't disagree with, with you, but it, you've hit the nail on the head. It's about that negotiation and that has not taken place. Yeah. There has been no negotiation with the members of that scheme to, to suggest where the assets come from, how, who makes those decisions. Ultimately, it's the trustees, but it's a membership scheme that pays into that. It's not a government-run scheme, and those officers have yet not been consulted with. There's been no engagement regarding the pensions or even the terms and conditions. And those are the officers that are sitting in the shadows waiting for that decision to be written down in paper and for them to make their decision regards whether they should retire because there's another element to the segregated part. If we transfer 230 um, British Transport Police officers into a segregated part, we've heard from the Chief Constable that 54 are able within the two years to retire. Immediately, 54 officers will take their potential lump sum from that pot of 230. Now that will have a massive impact on that pot, whether there's, from day one, there's 99 million pound assets. From that first day, it could be impacted on massively. And what you've got to think about is not just simply day one. We've got to consider those officers who are young in service, who still have 30, 35 years, and the liabilities that need to cover their fund. And that is something that's simply just not being considered from the information that we we, um, we have possession of at the moment. If I, if I may, this highlights the, the, what I see as being the, one of the biggest uh, frailties of what's been undertaken so far is that some of the human elements are being done last, uh, whereas uh, the, undoubtedly the, most of the legislative stuff has been dealt with, the technical stuff is being thrashed out, but some of that technical stuff has got an impact on the human side. Uh, and if we 
and I think collectively everyone would agree with this, but if we were to turn this around and make sure that the human things are taken care of first and the technical stuff will work around it. And I, I, I mean, I have nothing but the highest degree of sympathy for the position that the British Transport Police officers find themselves in, because at this point in time, they just don't know. And I think that that's a failure on all parts that have been involved in this up till now. Uh, had the SPF been involved at an earlier stage, and uh, I know we've had, I mean, we could have a very good bilateral series of discussions with the British Transport Police Federation, we would have made sure that the officers would have been front and centre of this. It's, all, it's understandable why there are doubts regarding the position of pensions for the British Transport Police officers, because no one's done a like for like comparison. I can't believe that that hadn't been high on the list of things to, to, to be considered. Uh, it's assumed, and it indeed it may well be the case, uh, that, the tra that the pension arrangements for British Transport Police officers are superior to those of, uh, for lack of a better term, Home Office Police Forces. Uh, only an actuarial comparison would provide information to that, would provide a definitive answer for that. And the issue of pensions is, of course, absolutely germane to the other issues that are associated with uh, the, the status of the British Transport Police Officers when they transfer over into the Police Service of Scotland. Because of the, because of the position that police officers hold as office holders and the, the occupational pension scheme that is available to police officers of the Police Service of Scotland, uh, that is the only scheme that is available to, uh, to police officers in Scotland. But I, I don't know. Um, in fact, I should probably have refreshed my, uh, my memory on the, the exact provisions, but I know that there are provisions that currently exist that allow transfers between the Home Office Forces and the British Transport Police uh, Service just now uh, that allows for cash equivalent transfer values from one pension scheme to the other. I, I would need to uh, remind myself uh, as to exactly what limitations are placed upon that, but it's certainly not unknown for officers to have transferred in the past. But where I think that there are possibly some opportunities, and th this is where I would make the biggest plea with the pause that we have in the proceedings just now, is to look at the human side and see what can be done to address many of those concerns. So, you know, we need to look at what would be known in the police service as the 1987 police pension scheme, which is the broadest he headline compatibility to what I understand the British Transport Police Pension Scheme to look like, uh, and have engagement with officials. Uh, granted, that's not officials within uh, the Scottish, exec the Scottish uh, side, it's officials at Whitehall, to see whether there will be a willingness to open the 87 pension scheme to allow transfer, should that be deemed desirable by officers that are going to be affected. And if we're able to get these kind of uh, proper options presented to officers so that they know what they're looking at, rather than face uncertainty, then I think they would be in a much better position to deal with some of the technical issues afterwards. Whereas just now we're trying to understand, we're trying to solve technical issues without understanding whether necessarily that's going to be best for the officers or whether it's going to, whether it's not. Because if I was sitting as a British Transport Police officer, I would be sitting saying, well, I know what I have just now, but I don't know what I'm going to be having in the future. Surely it makes more sense to say to officers, and I understand the importance of a triple lock guarantee to many in the British Transport Police Service, but no detriment does also not mean that there is no betterment. And it also does not mean that should there be a decision by individual officers to volunteer to seek betterment in some conditions, that that might not necessarily come as a, come as a consequence of a willingness to accept perceived detriment in others. And to me, the logical thing to do is to allow the staff associations, and I'm sure that I'm, well, I'm, I'm saying sure is probably a bit much, but I'm optimistic uh, that my colleagues from the British Transport Police Federation would agree with me that allowing officers to see on a compare and contrast basis exactly what they could be looking at uh, would help resolve a huge amount of the human issues that are being presented um, are certainly being raised by those that have concerns about it. The legislative stuff will take care of itself and then the technical stuff will take care of, will fall from uh, the agreements that could, be, that could be reached between the parties. Mr McMahon, you were nodding, do you concur? I, I agree absolutely with the view that the human element of this has been neglected, that it's part of the rationale for a replan. Pensions, as you know, difficult to you know, understand and engage with, actually you know, it has a, a bottom line impact on people and that needs to be taken seriously. It's work that's been led through the workforce, work stream, um, under the joint programme board. Um, decisions around segregated schemes and so on were taken. Police Scotland's role in that has been to seek um, a, a view in terms of um, future liabilities and so on. But going back to Mr McPherson's point, we would work on the basis that there's a fair and equitable split of assets and liabilities because that's the approach that we want to take to full integration. Still on the integrated costs um, supplementary, 
Tavish Scotland, Tavish, is this is your first time um, at the committee in public. Do you have any relevant interest? No, no, to Convener, um, um, thank you. Can I just ask a few uh, very brief questions on costs, if I could? <laughs> what has been the cost of integration so far for both Police Scotland and for the British Transport Police? I'm happy to answer that. Um, in terms of specific costs, we've discussed EY's programme management support. That's uh, 400,000. That's a shared cost between ourselves and the BTPA. We've engaged EY to undertake uh, due diligence around the finance assets and liabilities of the BTPA. Um, that's costing approximately 300,000. Um, in terms of Police Scotland's dedicated resources and any recruitment that we need to undertake, that will be subject to the replan, so I wouldn't be able to put a figure on, on that at the moment. There are costs associated with the setup of the segregated pension scheme, which are in the region of 400,000. And in terms of the replan itself, which will bring more clarity around uh, costs, among other things, um, we've paid EY 117,000. Uh, to take us through phase one, which is effectively a review of work streams um, and a, a, a refocus of activity in order to have the best possible foundation for the replan itself. So that's 1.2 million so far. And what's the budget for uh, the period between now and, the, uh, and uh, April 19, if that's the date that is now being worked towards? Well, April 19 isn't what we're working towards anymore, and the replan will give us a, a, so we don't know what a, date new, it is. a new target. That we haven't established okay. the date yet. That will emerge so, from... So is there a budget for the future period? We will establish what that is. We have the police reform budget, of course, which... Um, how much? How much is a police reform budget every year? You, you'll have to forgive me. I have the one note that I meant to bring with me. What's the police reform I've not budget? Got the, I've not got the number in front of me, so I don't want to make something up. But that... Um, that budget gives us flexibility and effectively we've, we're in agreement with Scottish Government in terms of access to that going forward. Okay, and you said you'd spent 300,000 so far on Ernst & Young. Do they continue in, in, uh, for the in the future? In terms of the programme management role, we've engaged them until April 2019, okay. the original integration date. In terms of their role in relation to the replan, um, Again, that, that would be a decision for the SROs as to whether they wanted to continue to engage EY, and there would be an additional cost associated with that. And do we know what that is? It was in the region of 600 to 700,000. More than already the 300 that's been spent if, on them. If EY were to stay with us on a replan that would run effectively into the autumn. So a million pounds but, on us. But there's no, there's no decision been taken as to whether that continues. Um, thank you very much. Mr McMahon, I, I just caught you at the, your earlier answer, I forget to which of my colleagues, in which you said on the business case that there was no plans as far as you, but correct me if I'm wrong, because I may have misinterpreted you, but no, far, no plans as far as you knew to have a business case. Is that right? Um, not as part of the replan exercise. We're working towards right. the stated will of the parliament. Um, I mean, it, may, it, may not, it may not be a fair question for you because it presumably predates you. But why was there not a business case done, given Audit Scotland and government policy on business cases? I'm not really the person to who, who answer that question. Who would be out of interest? Your next panel. Next panel. Okay. Can I keep that one for then? Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Convener. Just a, a couple of clarifications, Mr McMahon, if I may. Uh, just on the points that uh, Mr Scott has just put to you, um, on all of these transition costs uh, and all the costs that are being incurred, who ultimately pays that? Where, where does the money come from to pay all those invoices? Those uh, amounts that I have uh, given you details of are, are being paid by Police Scotland at the moment. Although, as I've said, the EY programme management support is a shared cost with BTPA. Right. Uh, and you were asked about the, the pension scheme. So again, just a matter of clarification, if I may. Do you know what the setup costs of any new scheme will be uh, and the admin costs of that scheme going forward? Uh, and again, who, who's going to pay that, please? We believe that it will be in the region of 400,000 to establish the segregated scheme. As to ongoing administration, I, I don't have a number, but I can certainly seek that and write to the committee if that would be helpful. It would be helpful. I, I, just going back to some of the points that have been made earlier, one would rather have thought that that would have been established up front. If you're going to set up a new pension scheme, one would have thought that the running cost of that ongoing and who was going to pay for that would have been established. But uh, you mentioned earlier on, perhaps in this regard, that the, the SPA had asked for an indemnification. 
uh, on future liabilities from the Scottish Government. Do you have any oversight on whether the Scottish Government will give that indemnification? Uh, and in any event, how much is that indemnification likely to be worth? Well, I, I, again, that would be your next panel that could give you some insight as to whether government was likely to offer SPA that indemnification that their accountable officer has sought. As to a quantum, I, I think that there, are, there is a spectrum of costs. Um, we've heard discussion about the current, based on the most recent valuation, um, there's a surplus. There's, the, there's a future possibility in terms of um, deficits, but that is associated with any pension scheme. So ultimately, we would be looking for, um, or SPA are certainly seeking uh, Scottish Government um, cover, if you like, for whatever those liabilities may be in the future. Are you able, you said there was a spectrum, just out of interest, are you able to give me the approximate range of that spectrum? Based on uh, government actuarial um, department advice that has been shared, um, I, I think the most dramatic numbers that have come into the public domain in the last few weeks are in the region of 100 million. I think that, that's based on the absolute worst case scenario, that's based on a cessation event now, it's moving the investment strategy of the scheme immediately onto a less, um, a more risk averse approach in terms of investment in guilt. Um, I'm not an actuary, I'll do my best to describe the, the position on, on this, but um, the, the numbers that have been around in the public domain are to emphasise an absolute worst case scenario that you would expect actuaries to provide. So given that we don't know, because the scheme hasn't been valued since 2015, it's due for valuation this year, I understand, um, we would be looking, or SPA have sought that cover in terms of whatever the, the liabilities may be. And so, so just to be absolutely clear, the SPA could be seeking an indemnification of around £100 million from the Scottish Government? Well, on an absolute worst case scenario based on actuarial advice that's been provided, but again, I would emphasise that that's, you know, it's estimated and it's highly dependent on market circumstances. Estimated ultimately. by whom? Well, it's been estimated by, the, I think, the Government Actuarial Department. Uh, Cam Steele, I'm aware you um, indicated you had to leave at 11 o'clock. Before you leave, can I ask you about this um, proposal that the integrated costs, the additional costs, come from the reform budget? Now, presumably, that was in place for the smooth transition of the single police force. Do you have any concerns about that? And is there anything going to be um, affected by that decision? Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, my favourite subject, the amount of funding that comes to the police service. And mm -hmm. I have to say that, in general, I think the Parliament hasn't provided enough. Um, and, of course, when it comes to the creation of the Police Service of Scotland, much of the reform funding that was identified was lost in the paying of uh, VAT for a, a number of years that uh, that was particularly uh, unfortunate. I mean, the, rea the reality is, is that, uh, as with anything that happens in, in Scottish public life, you know, the taxpayer ends up footing the bill somewhere. Uh, and decisions that are taken in Parliament have to be much by parliamentary decisions on funding to make sure that the will of Parliament is able to be discharged by those that are uh, asked to discharge those functions based on funding. Uh, but certainly, given that the police service has got uh, needs of its own uh, at this point in time that uh, are not helped by a, a lack of funding, and I'll make no apologies for making that point, uh, the removal or the additional burden of, uh, of funding is something that I would hope you as parliamentarians would be pressing the government on to make sure that that is, that that is addressed. Okay, and just the last supplementary, it may uh, or may not involve Mr Steele, and then is there anything you want to add after um, Daniel's asked his, his question before you leave? It's not addressed to, to Mr Steele, it's just a clarification on the, the, the line of questioning from Tavish Scott. The, the, the list of figures you gave there, if I heard correctly, are all attributable to Ernst & Young. Uh, an external uh, provider, what are the internal costs of the integration programme? Because the, the, those would be in addition to those in terms of staff time and so on from Police Scotland. Yeah, I mean, as part of the replan exercise, we're reassessing that. There's n there was a formal bid for resources that I reported to the SPA in December, and it was in the region of a million pounds in terms of um, the you know, the opportunity cost, if you like, of existing staff working on this, that's being revisited. And I think as part of a new approach to the, the, the planning towards full integration, 
a resourcing plan will be part of that and I would be revisited upwards or downwards. I have absolutely no idea at the moment, but I expect us to dedicate people towards this um, in order to achieve the, the will of Parliament. Okay, and is there anything that you want to add before you depart, Mr. Uh, th there is convener, and uh, it's to some extent it's to reiterate, uh, and I'll slightly expand on the point I made earlier, that the, uh, to my mind this is an exercise that has to put the people at its heart. Uh, we have to look at the impact on officers and staff and make sure that we properly understand them, rather than assume that things are going to be worse, which is a natural position if you don't know what your alternative is. I think it's incumbent on, on all people involved in this programme to make sure that the officers and staff are aware of exactly what an alternative uh, could be. Uh, my uh, colleagues and friends in the British Transport Police Foundation and I have had some discussions regarding the, the you know, potentials as to what could be as to what could be put before them. But I know instinctively, because of my uh, particular interest in policing terms and conditions across the UK, that Police Scotland's terms and conditions are almost unrivalled. Uh, and I suspect that if presented with uh, a sensible uh, options exercise that we could uh, help ameliorate many of the concerns that currently exist and deal with, uh, deal with the concerns of British Transport Police officers. But that can only be done by making sure that the people are at its heart, then the technical stuff will follow. Like I said, the legislative stuff is taking care of itself and uh, I believe that that will be welcomed by uh, many, of the, many of the officers in BTP to have some degree of certainty over what their future might be. Mr. Goodland, before Mr. Steele leaves. Just before he does, and given um, Mr. Steele the opportunity to respond, there is slight um, difference with British Transport Police Pension Scheme in that the officers, uh, for example, who are on a 30-year scheme, when they reach 50 years of age and 30 years, they can continue their police and service and continue investing into the pensions. That doesn't devalue. If anything, it's a guaranteed increase. Alternatively, within the Home Office police forces, they have to retire at the 30-year um, level, or 35 as it is, because there is a devaluation of, um, not devaluation, sorry, but there, yeah, it, it differs in what, they, what their take-home is if they continue working, where British Transport Police don't have that. They can extend their employment up to the age of 60, and on application for an extension beyond that. And that differs in the Home Office, my understanding of that. There is also the issue of British Transport Police officers are employees. Um, we haven't resolved the issue yet who will represent the officers because they're not Crown officers, they're not um, office holders as Police Scotland officers are. They, are, they have a, a contract of employment they have a redundancy resettlement agreement. Some have compulsory redundancy. And these type of issues have, have not been resolved. And British Transport Police officers will not surrender that protection to transfer over as Crown officers until they know there will be no detriment to them. And Mr Steele's right. It is about the people and we need to engage with them and get their views, which we have obtained on many occasions and there is no suggestion from anyone within the British Transport Police in D Division that they wish to transfer as Crown officers and adopt the terms and conditions of those officers in Police Scotland because there are little bits within our own terms and conditions that differ um, and that potentially could create a detriment. Okay, thank you. Nothing further, Ted? No. In that case, we move on to a question from Maurice Corey. Um, the, sorry, was that question? Ten. Yeah. Um, looking, can I just come back to some point that's really bugging me at the moment, Convene, and it's not the question I was going to hear. I just feel in all this, and it follows on from Callum Steele's comments, and I feel this quite strongly, it is, not, is it not a gross error that the BTP as people assets seem to have been totally ignored throughout this whole process so far? Can I ask the Chief Constable to comment first? Well, I think, um, I think Callum and Nigel and uh, Tom and I have all been very clear. The people are the most important thing in this. The people are um, what will make this work. Mm -hmm. The people are the, the ones who have the skills. And I've been immensely proud of, um, of my officers and staff who, through um, a number of years now of uncertainty, have 
shown their resilience and their commitment to delivering great service to the public. That, I think we should all acknowledge how fantastic they've been. The, um, I think it is a, a matter of great regret that, that, it, that they've not been engaged to the level that they should have been. And I made this point at one of the joint programme boards. And I think everybody accepts that. And I think in the, uh, the replanning, there is a commitment, which I'm very keen to see turn into action, that uh, there will be, will be far more engagement with the individuals. Because I think, actually, as I've been listening to all the questions, sort of Mr McPherson's question about pensions, actually, we, we are all at one, that we want to be sure that the people who transfer are treated fairly and they've got a proper pension when they come. So we're absolutely committed to a proper discussion around pensions. But as we've heard here, it is incredibly complex. It's not as simple as anybody thought when they first embarked on this. And my plea in all of this is that an appropriate amount of time is given to replanning, and an appropriate amount of time is given to implementation so that all these things can be worked through and the people who transfer over are treated fairly and end up wanting to be committed railway police officers and staff in the new structures that they, that they go forward. But you're absolutely right, the engagement's not been strong enough so far. Um, I think the, uh, I find myself often at a disadvantage because people look to me to the answers and I haven't got the answers. The answers rest with other people. And I'm really keen that we start to sort out the details of all these complex issues and involve our staff in discussions around them. Can I, yes, can I ask a question? And the question, the original question I wanted to ask, but I also, that was a burning issue. I had to get off my chest, and I'm very grateful for what you said. Yeah. Nigel Goodman, would you like to comment on that first question? Yeah, I totally echo what the Chief Constable has said. I think we've all um, got to take responsibility um, regarding the engagement side. I feel as, as much as the pressure as the Chief Constable that people look for the Staff Association to provide them with the answers. And it was the pause and the acknowledgement that engagement has been poor was welcomed by the Federation. But unfortunately, since the 20th of February, we were told that engagement would improve. And the first step was to have a day of engagement. And that was going to take part in, in March of this year. We're still waiting for a date, for a day of engagement. I have myself written to the Minister of the Transport and Islands, um, seeking clarity, to the point the last letter, um, he's, it's suggested that it's gone off to the various departments to obtain uh, answers to my questions. I attended the Scottish Police Authorities meeting um, only a couple of weeks ago, and we posed a number of questions which were declined. Uh, we were given no answers to the questions. So on the evidence that we're seeing so far, Yes, there's an acknowledgement of in, that the engagement's been poor, but there has been no action to address that. It's simply words at the moment, and our officers are still suffering a level of uncertainty. And that is absolutely appalling, that the Scottish Government, who keep constantly reminding us that the, one of their three aims for full integration was about accountability to people of Scotland. Well, British Transport Police officers and staff in D Division are people of Scotland. They're proud Scots. They're proud of being British Transport Police and they're proud of living in Scotland. But they've lived two years of uncertainty. They feel, the term that they've used to me is they feel abandoned by not only their force, but by their government. And that, for me, is pretty disgusting. And it's, it's, it's alarming that, that they feel in that way, really. Engagement. Sorry? Who's leading on the engagement? Well, the Joint Programme Board should be leading on the engagement. We're still waiting for, for dates. Um, we're, we haven't been given... Because one, one day event won't resolve the level of distrust that is amongst the officers at the moment. It needs to be much more than that. So I'm, I'm open that both British Transport Police Authority, the Scottish Police Authority, with the Joint Chairs of the Joint Programme Board, are some way towards mapping out at least six months of engagement with the officers to identify and answer some of their concerns. Because there's talk about, for example, their transfer as is. But if they want to um, progress with their, within their careers within Police Scotland, if they want to seek promotion, then they lose 
the as is. Um, they, they will then transfer to Police Scotland as office holders, so they lose their terms and conditions. Well, that is handcuffing our officers. That's a detriment because none of them will then seek any career progression or promotion outside of the railway division if the threat is that they're going to lose their terms and conditions and potentially uh, their pensions. We're, well, not lose their pensions, but there will be a detriment to the pension. Can Sup just, two supplementary. Can I just small one, just to follow on this. Can I give Mr McMahon a chance? What's your response to what these two gentlemen have said? I mean, how are you going to deliver a positive message to encourage? You're a sales manager, so we say. You're out flogging your products. How are you going to sell them? Because here you hear what the market's saying. I, I, you know, I perhaps wouldn't put it in the terms that Mr Goodband has, but we acknowledge, as members of the Joint Programme Board, that engagement has been very poor. That's absolutely accepted. It's part of the rationale for a replan that we get engagement right, but we work through that joint programme board. You're about to speak to the SROs of that joint programme board, and ultimately, you know, Police Scotland has gone out. We've engaged with D Division staff. I know that ACC Higgins took part in a number of events pre Christmas to try to provide some level of reassurance, but again, part of the problem has been the absence of detail. So I think the arrival of a new SRO in the Scottish Government. Um, you know, Donna has made very clear that she's going to invest in comms and engagement capability um, to supplement what, what's already there. Um, and I think that's a really positive step. But I absolutely recognise the points that Nigel makes that it needs to happen. Thank you. Supplementary, Daniel, and then you. I'm just very slightly concerned by one of the comments you made there, that, that the implication being that in order to engage with the SPA, you felt that you've had to submit public questions to the SPA board. Could, could you maybe just clarify that? I mean, what engagement have you had with the SPA, uh, the SPA board and Susan Deacon uh, both uh, uh, up till now? How would you characterise that engagement? I've had none whatsoever. I've personally um, visited the SPA um, open meetings and we, at the last meeting, uh, felt the need, in the absence of any other information, and we welcomed the pause, and then we were informed that the draft orders were in draft form, um, the 104 and the 90 orders, but they haven't been shared with us. Very similar to the pensions proposal, when that was initially um, given to the trustees, it took 50 days of me knocking on the door of the Department of Transport who kindly then shared that um, because they, they were alarmed that it hadn't been shared with us right from the outset. And we felt, in the absence of any um, answers to some of the questions, there were four particular questions that we would like the SPA to answer, and it was around um, the liabilities, pensions liabilities, the proposal. And the decision 24 hours prior to that meeting was that those questions would not be answered. And that, for us, was not a demonstration of trying to improve engagement with our um, members, which so, was very disappointing. I mean, just to be fair to the SPA, I mean, had you formally asked for meetings or formally put those questions in correspondence prior to tabling those public questions? Was that the first time you were asking those questions, or had you asked them previously? It was the first time we posed those questions. Okay. Rona? Yes, <coughs> thank you. Um, just... just um, to be clear, my understanding is, I'm not going to comment on the level of engagement that you've had, but my understanding is that um, the Transport Minister informed the Federation several times, almost right from the start of the process, that there would be no detriment to your members' pay and that their pay and pensions would be a triple lock guarantee in pensions. Is that not the case? That is the case. We have had, um, in um, written form, um, the um, triple lock guarantee. But that is simply a statement without substance. There is no detail within the letter that shows what exactly those guarantees are. When you see language in a letter that says that it's the Scottish Government's intentions, it's their aim, it's their view, that's not, in writing, a guarantee. And that's ultimately what the officers want to see. They want that reassurance. There is actually a triple lock guarantee, but the language in the pensions proposal itself, as I've described to Mr McPherson, the intentions are that the members shouldn't suffer a um, higher contributions in the pensions. But again, there's no guarantee, it's just simply an intention. 
And that is not the language that our officers are seeking for that reassurance to fit the triple lock guarantee that's been proposed. Okay, George. Thank you, Convener. Yeah, Mr. Goodman, just, just to go over again over what my colleague Daniel Johnson asked. When you asked the, of the SPA for the information, you know, that was the first communication you made yourself was straight to the board and in the way you did? Yes, it, it was the first time that we, through the process of um, the authority having o public open meetings, we... Would, would there not have been a better way to actually try and do this? Because we keep talking about how everybody needs to talk to one another and need to get things forward. Would it not have been a better way for you to do it rather than to, with a great respect, showboat at a meeting? Um, well, personally, I didn't see it as showboating at a meeting. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was a point of, from day one, and... Um, We've, we've been sitting with a level of uncertainty, and I think Mr McMahon has confirmed that what has been a struggle with the engagement from the outset is the detail. Because everybody knows there has never been a business case. Mm -hmm. There has never been a written down plan. I get that, but would there not have been better lines of communication than to do about that process? Potentially, yes. Um, but prior to that date, it was not my view that the SPA were the ones that potentially could answer the, the questions because they themselves wouldn't have had the detail. It was only at that point when we welcomed the pause, we thought there was an acceptance by the Joint Programme Board that there were risk and that there were concerns around engagement that we considered, well, this was an opportunity for those, some of those questions to be answered so by the So just for my own clarification, and just stop me from being slow here, but... Uh, so you asked the SPA a question that you didn't think they'd answer for? No, previously I didn't previously. think. Previously? Yeah. Right, okay then. Yeah. Uh, Firstly, I understand the, the position Mr Goodman is in trying to uh, get answers, entirely reasonable answers for his members, and he'll be aware that even supporters of integration like myself repeatedly ask questions in this very room yes. seeking assurances, and I'm disappointed that we're not further on with that. Convener, I would like to ask, um, I, I, there's been a lot of discussion about um, costs and I just on, on, on two specific issues, and that is uh, the role of the railway operating companies. Has there been discussions with them about the allocation of costs, Mr McMahon perhaps or Mr Crowther, and particularly regarding the uh, aspect of training, please? Uh, yes, happy to answer that, Mr Finney. Um, I've convened a number of meetings now with the Railway Development Group. Um, I think we've now had three engagements. I have a fortnightly call with uh, Mark Newton, their convener, and the purpose of those um, updates really um, that started around about, I think, October, November, was to give them an idea of progress, to move discussions on as well as to overall funding. Um, you know, we're working on the basis of a transfer of assets um, and, and so forth to the value of, you know, 21 million, I think, is what's been identified as the current cost of D-Division. Um, you know, we're, we're not working on the basis that the train operating companies have a new cost to meet around this, and I sought to give them reassurance as to our process. In fact, that was then overtaken by the decision that we should delay um, and move towards a replan. A significant part of that replan activity will be um, the, the development of railway policing agreements as set out in the Act, which we're determined to do. But having come to this landscape around about August of last year, it was clear to me that the work around due diligence, for example, to enable us to have a clear split of assets, to fully understand the cost model that BTP use at the moment, to either replicate or to develop our own cost model and then engage with the train operating companies, that had not started quickly enough and we effectively did not have time to have a sufficiently strong engagement with the rail operating companies themselves. So I think we're, rec we're recovering that ground and you know, the due diligence work is, is progressing, it's underway, it will report in the next few months um, and that will give us a stronger foundation on which to engage with the, the tra train operating companies. Mr Crowther, did you have any points at all on that? Yes, I guess... Um, uh, Without seeking to speak on behalf of the, of, of the rail industry, I think um, from my conversations with them, their, their concerns fit into two key areas. One is the cost of integration and um, 
uh, I, I think if they were here, they would they would question why, because you know the funding model is that our funds are raised from the from the train operators, and so um, uh, I'm sure they would say they're not quite sure why they are paying the cost of integration around uh, th that it's costing BTP for that. So that's one point that they would make. Um, the I'm second, sorry to interrupt you there, Mr. Crowther, and has it been confirmed to them that they will be expected to meet these yes. costs? Yes. Yes. So the, the, the funding model is kind of a user pays, and, and it's been assessed uh, uh, by the Department for Transport that this is a cost of policing, and therefore it's passed on to the uh, within our our core budget around that. So uh, that's a, um, a debate we we often have with them. The second area I think is is around how charges will be allocated in the future. And Tom's um, touched on this. So we have a very complex um, charging model that has lots of uh, proxies that feed into it and um, uh, to say it causes some anxiety every t every year when the charges are allocated out to different people would probably be an understatement uh, as people look at you know, why their charges have, have changed. So it is a, a bone of contention even with, with us. So what people are very concerned to see is how will charges be allocated in the new policing model. Um, relatively straightforward for ScotRail the, the operator that operates exclusively within Scotland, but pretty much more complicated for those who have cross-border services, so Virgin East Coast, Virgin West Coast, Cross Country, and some of the other operators. And so they're very keen to understand how will the charges for the, the railway division in Police Scotland be allocated out, and how does that fit with our already very complex charging model. And as Tom said, there either needs to be a model adopted by Police Scotland which is similar to ours um, or one that is completely separate uh, that needs to be sorted through. That takes a lot of negotiation. If it affects our charging model, we have to, we are contractually obliged to give certain periods of notice. Uh, if it changes the charging model, we have to give three years notice uh, around, around those issues. And then it plays back into day-to-day um, -day things like uh, uh, ICT systems, because our charging is derived from activities. So our command and control system pinpoints where a crime happens on a particular station to a particular operator, and policing activity is attributed to a particular operator. So you can see it's quite a complex model. And uh, Police Scotland need a command and control system that can work that all out for them. Hence you can see why this is a pretty complex issue. Can I ask about the duration of existing contracts then? Is, would, is that likely to influence a, a, an integration date um, or a, is it a uniform across the train operating so, companies or are they different? So the, um, the police service agreements are um, an ongoing uh, contract. So it's a, it's a, um, it's a condition of uh, franchises. So what, someone who holds a franchise uh, agreement must have a police service agreement and they're, they're sort of roll on. The, the bit where there is um, uh, a time factor to it is in terms of our day-to-day -day contracts. So for estates, um, uh, facilities management, um, ICT contracts, etc. We need to give 12 months notice around, uh, around those contracts to our providers. Hence why Tom mentioned we were at a critical time just before the pause, because by now we would have had to have given notice of those contracts ceasing and no baiting over to Police Scotland if the April 2019 date were to have been met. So there is a time criticality around the sequencing of when notice must be given. Okay, um, uh, and uh, um, Mr McMahon, uh, I wonder, are you able to say if Police Scotland's uh, undertaken a cost benefits analysis of integration? Or? Uh, no, we haven't. We are monitoring costs and I've, I've given you some sense of, of those. I know that the, um, the Joint Programme Board have, you know, overseen that, that there's work to be done around benefits analysis and a description of those. Um, and I would expect as we start to work within the more um, formalised and um, multi-agency PMO that there will be a continued focus on emerging costs. But we haven't undertaken a cost-benefit analysis in terms of informing an options appraisal as it normally would. And can you just clarify finally, who, who would do that? Would it be the the board, the, the PMO, or would it be Police Scotland? Well, or I think would, would, would there be a global one informed by various component parts? 
I, th I think that would be a task that your next panel could probably speak to in terms of how they might pursue that. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Okay. I think uh, prior to the MTT being stood down, uh, I think on the 29th of March, Police Scotland undertook to conduct a cost-benefit analysis uh, at the request of the SPA. So is that still going to go ahead? And if so, when will it report? What I understand is we're now working through the, the PMO um, and in terms of conversations with uh, the, the SRO, uh, in terms of Donna Bell, um, we can capture costs and we should. There should be work done to assess benefits, but the direction of travel is towards full integration. A cost-benefit analysis, if you like, would normally inform an options appraisal. We're not undertaking an options appraisal. We're not, we're not looking at other options, and that was a decision of the Joint Programme Board. I understand that, but on the 23rd of March, I think I'm correct in saying that Police Scotland undertook to conduct a cost-benefit analysis, so will that happen as well, far as you're aware? I think it's important to clarify for the benefit of the committee what we'll commit to undertake, which is capture costs as they relate to full integration and contribute to their articulation of benefits. Thank you. Jenny Cogut. Thank you, Convener. Um, I want to go back to some of the ICT issues that have been highlighted in, in today's session. So Dr Kath Murray's submission points to problematic Police Scotland ICT architecture. And in the BTP submission, Paul Crowther, you talk of the risk around ICT systems. And uh, Nigel Goodband, in your uh, submission, you talk about railway partners assisting BTP with tasks, for example, stopping trains via a seamless GB-wide command and control system that operates throughout railway infrastructure. Research published today um, shows that 35% of ICT service outages have been caused by a cyber attack covering 312 critical infrastructure organisations in the UK, including police forces. Surely then, Paul Crowther, you would accept that the current ICT setup is not faultless and conversely, doesn't integration offer an opportunity to iron out some of the ICT problems that currently exist? I could answer that quite shortly, I think, in terms of... You know, no, the, um, uh, in terms of our uh, protection against cyber attack, you would imagine that we have got the same sort of measures in place that any police force has. Uh, in terms of the railway infrastructure, it's part of the critical national infrastructure and issues relating to sort of vulnerability to cyber attack would be undertaken by the Centre for Protection of National Infrastructure, CPNI. Uh, and they are very active with government and others to, to ensure that that is secure. So I, I, I'm certainly not aware of any uh, risk that integrating into Police Scotland would mitigate. I'm not sure if I've misread the question. Is that... I suppose the question really is, are there current problems that you are aware of within the, the current setup that you accept perhaps exist? No, in not terms really. of ICT, it's absolutely a perfect system. Well, I think, I think what I'd say is, from an operational perspective, we have control rooms that are linked into all of the railway operating control rooms across the country. Um, so if we need to communicate with the industry, which we do probably hundreds of times a day about incidents, we've, we've got seamless um, arrangements in place to do that the length and breadth of the country. Um, Police Scotland doesn't have any of that. It would need to create that and um, it would need to ensure that it was doing that, in my view, from a single control room. As I said earlier, this is a national function and it needs to, be needs to be commanded in a national function. And my understanding at the moment is that Police Scotland have a number of control rooms. It would have to designate one of those, in my view, that was the lead control room for uh, railway policing. And therefore, it would need to operate on a pan Police Scotland basis rather than a geographic basis, as I understand it currently does. Mm -hmm. So I think our system is um, pretty good. It works. It's tested every day. And what we're trying to do is replicate a system that would work as effectively in safety critical decisions in the Police Scotland environment. I'll give you an example. Uh, every time there is a, if there is a fatality, one of the first things that um, my control room does is to engage and get patched through on the radio to the driver of the train who gives an account of what happened. That enables us to make an immediate risk assessment around whether it's a suspicious or a non-suspicious act. It enables us to make decisions around how we then react 
And how we then react determines whether there are impacts down the, down the line with blockages, which can then lead to safety issues as people are stuck on trains. When people get unstuck on, stuck on trains, they have a tendency to open the door and get out onto the track. Mm -hmm. So we have a system in place that does that. My point is, we must ensure that when we integrate, Police Scotland have a similar system in place, and it therefore needs an integrated IT system which will enable it to do that. Those are the risks that I think mm -hmm. we've got. Provided we take the time, and provided we make sure that all the, the issues are in place and the integrations are in place, those can be overcome, but they can't be rushed, in my view. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, just raise a quick point on our view on the full integration um, proposal is that Police Scotland want one seamless command and control. Well, that in itself, on the railway infrastructure, will create a dual command and control, because you'll have com command and control from British Transport Police in England and Wales, but then you'll have a separate command and control within Scotland. So, in essence, they're not achieving a, sim a seamless one command and control throughout the country. It will be purely for Scotland only. That's the view of the Federation. Thank you. Mary, did you have any further questions? It was just a quick question, uh, which probably harks back to the point that George Adam raised earlier and maybe touches on something that Rona Mackay had raised as well. And I suppose it's just about, I, I think George had talked about the, the contact with the SPA and it was really just about the, uh, had these concerns been raised directly with the government as well and just really, I'd be interested to know what the relationship has been like and engagement like uh, with the Scottish Government on some of the issues that have been identified. Um, or just generally to... Oh, right. yeah. so, well, the engagement started off pretty well, if I'm honest, with the Justice Secretary um, meeting um, myself and members of um, TSSA. Um, unfortunately, once the bill um, passed through Parliament, it kind of came to a halt. And every time we posed any questions, we got the three statements of the aims of the Scottish Government, which was the seamless command and control, the accountability to the people of Scotland, and the um, access to the wider access to specialism within Police Scotland. And we've posed questions such as, well, what is that specialism? What is the specialism of Police Scotland that's going to be offered to the railway division that BTP currently don't have. I mean, I know we don't have air support, but other than that, BTP have been functioning on the railways for over 100 years, and we have specialism within the force. So when we ask, well, what is it that, what is this enhancement that keeps being talked about, this access to specialism? Uh, and it seems that we don't get a response. Um, so since the bill has passed, I would say that engagement with the Scottish Government has lapsed. Perhaps at the point that Mr Adam made regarding how I pose those questions to the SPA is a, a correct interpretation and perhaps we should have given consideration to be engaging with the SPA in, a, in another format or a, in another way. I'll take that criticism on board, but at that time, in the absence of anybody else giving us any answers to the questions, we thought it was a correct or an ideal opportunity to pose questions to uh, the SPA. Uh, but I take on board uh, the view that it could have been done uh, in an alternative method. So just to clarify then, had you tried to engage with the government, but you felt that you weren't getting the responses back, but you weren't getting the same Yes, and, and, and I've shared the correspondence with the convener that we've given to um, particularly um, the Minister for Transport and the Islands, uh, where we've posed various questions and we don't feel that the questions are being answered. Mr uh, Yusuf has suggested that he has received a response from the trustees, for example, for the pensions, stating that the pensions is a viable option. The trustees have not said that. We are not aware that the proposals is a viable option. We have concerns around the language within it. There is no covenants within the proposal. And the trustees have simply sent the proposal back, saying it needs to be developed further before there is any consideration or whether there's an acceptance of the proposal. Um, so 
when we're asking, well, where's this information coming from? It seems that it's just uh, not being answered. And 73 questions were, were put into the Joint Programme Board through the civil servants. 73 questions that we collated from officers of the British Transport Police. They extended beyond that, but we focused on the main um, problems and concerns. Those 73 answers, have, we've been told, have been sent to the various departments to seek the answers. There's no time frame. There's nothing to suggest when those answers are going to come back. And we're now waiting three months since we've submitted those 72, 73 questions. Uh, and it's astonishing that you know, somebody, out of those 73 questions, there aren't some answers. Um, but it seems currently there are no answers to the questions. And that's alarming at this stage, particularly when two years ago we were here kind of raising concern around the time frame and it was suggested by um, Police Scotland that two years was a luxury and here we are two years on and we still haven't got answers to the questions. I, I think at the time that the comment was made about two years being a, a luxury to deliver this, there was probably an underestimate as to the complexity. The HMI report helped to expose that. But what I would say is that the, the commitment that we've made, and to answer the point about Scottish Government engagement, as you would expect, Police Scotland has regular and positive engagement with the Scottish Government. Um, our commitment to the, the replan is, is very clear, and we hear absolutely the concerns that Nigel and others have raised. And we want to work within that framework to be led by the PMO um, and then deliver the answers quickly. So if you have good and um, co cooperation with the Scottish Government, obviously it would concern you if you're hearing um, from Mr Good and Ms Brother that that, that doesn't exist? Well, well, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And okay. that's as partners at the Joint Programme Board, we would absolutely reflect that position in our view as well. That concludes our questioning. It's been a very long but very worthwhile session. Can I thank all the witnesses for attending? We're now going to spend briefly and um, have a five-minute upward break.
welcome our second panel on BTP integration, Dan Moore, Deputy Director, Real Market Strategy, Department of Transport, and Donna Bell, Deputy Director, Police Divisions with the Scottish Government. And can I thank you both for your written submissions again, uh, as always, very helpful to the committee. Before we go uh, to questions from members, can I pose the question that I posed to, to the previous panel, given full integration hasn't really started, in fact, it's been suspended, given the, um, the costs um, which have risen considerably and are still unquantified and, and the risks that are developing and what's turning out to be quite a complex process. Do you think there's an opportunity to look at other op uh, options, um, including uh, for the, um, the integration or for the delivery of railway policing in Scotland, including the Commission service model? Yeah, so thank you, first of all, to the, the committee for, for inviting us. It's a really good opportunity to, particularly at this stage, as the convener says, it's a significant stage in the, the project. It's a really good opportunity for us to just talk through where we think things are. Uh, picking up the specific question, um, I see this as not so much a question for the Joint Programme Board, the, the issue of options, but as the Prime Minister made clear a couple of weeks ago, fundamentally the responsibility has been devolved and the consideration of those options has also been devolved. Um, so essentially the question becomes a matter for both the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament to consider. And I think certainly my understanding from the last joint programme board was that the Scottish Government had considered, I'm speaking a little bit for Donna here, but I'm very, very conscious that that had been considered and the view was taken at that stage that full integration remained the right sort of way to go. So the question was how we make that make that work. Yeah. And all I would add to that is um, Mr Matheson has appeared before this committee and there has been a range of debate in the Parliament. His um, clear view is that integration is the best way forward. Um, so that is not a decision for us as the SROs of the JPB. Get that, but it was worth posing Absolutely. the question in any case. <laughs> Rona. Thank you, Convener. Uh, afternoon, morning panel. Um, just, just a wee follow-on from that, just to, to, to flag up, of course, that this, this was, bill was actually passed in Parliament for this, so, you know, that, that kind of speaks for itself. Um, can I ask you, maybe, if you could expand on um, some views that we heard in the previous panel, there are, there are a number of significant operational matters yet to be resolved and to confirm the organisational leads for operational integration. Yes, um, and I think... Um, the evidence that Police Scotland and BTP presented to the Joint Programme Board on the 20th of February did highlight um, that there were a range of operational issues that still required to be resolved. Um, we took that on board um, and were happy on that basis to consider a pause. So I would be clear that work has not stopped on this. We have not... Um, we have not suspended or paused. We continue to move forward as part of the replanning process. And as part of that, the work streams um, are being reviewed, but we expect that they will remain very similar um, to those that were in place before. Um, and on that basis, we wouldn't expect the work stream leads to change in any great order. And I think that reflects the evidence that Tom McMahon gave to you too. Thank you. Dan, would you? I agree with that. I think the issue for us is that we want to use the replanning exercise in the right sort of way. And although we think that the basic structure of the programme looks like the right sort of basic structure of the programme. I think Donna and I have been really clear that our commitment here is to whatever works. So something which builds the maximum degree of commitment, the maximum degree of practicality. And if in those conversations over the course of the next couple of weeks, a particular change is advocated, which makes sense, then clearly as a joint programme board, we'll consider that. But I think the leads were very much decided to try to align leadership with the organisation which is best placed to deliver the particular task at, ha at hand. And I don't think that the tasks have changed sufficiently that leadership is likely to change. Can I ask you um, if at this stage you um, could say when and how the, the, the rephase planning proposal um, would be agreed and whether it will include an actual integration date? The um, replanning uh, rephasing exercise is underway at the moment um, and we expect that to um, come to some conclusions by the end of August 
And at that point, August this year. August this year, yep. yes. Um, and at that point, we will put forward views to ministers um, on a proposed date um, of integration. At that point, uh, would you speculate it might be next year, or, or but sorry, the year after 2020, or would you? And speculate at, at this, this point, stage. and that is the. I understand that. That's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Again, it's what works. I think there is one just point to phrase in no, that sure. essentially the, the date must effectively align to financial years just because of the way in which the industry operates. So yeah. it's unlikely to be the 15th of October. It would be the 1st of April at some point. Yeah, I understand that. Thank you. Daniel? Yes, I'd just <coughs> like to look at the role of the pro Programme Management Office and MTT. Now, my understanding is the MTT was instituted in the autumn of uh, last year as a direct result of questions around governance from HMICS. But the programme management office, in terms of the way it's been described so far, very much as a sort of a functional programme management. So how are those governance issues going to be addressed? And, and, and could you just sort of give a description of how the PMO will, will, will operate, both from a governance perspective and a sort of an operational programme perspective? Because they are distinct. Yes, yes, of course. Um, the Programme Management Office is an administrative function that will provide advice and support to the Joint Programme Board. The Joint Programme Board will take responsibility for all the decisions that are made and will have a role in the accountability functions. The PMO, as Tom McMahon already described, will include members from each of the agencies who are involved and um, that will help us to provide greater coherence to the work that we're doing. The way that the PMO will work will uh, means that it will provide information to the Joint Programme Board uh, to enable it to make decisions and provide better advice to ministers. It will cover next steps, it will assess risk and will consider issues so that we are, as JPB SROs, better informed uh, going forward. And I think that really reflects the um, HMIC um, report that was published last year um, and refers directly to the work that Audit Scotland have done on the um, joint, uh, merging and joining of public bodies, um, which has highlighted clear leadership, um, clear objectives and a longer term um, approach to planning. So that will enable us to all work together in a collective fashion to pull that together. And as Dan says, um, the thing that we're most interested in is getting to a point where we understand very clearly what is going to work uh, going forward. So it's, it's got a, just to sort of paraphrase, a, a functional role yes. so that the, the JPB can provide the accountability and governance, yes. is that correct? So there is no um, accountability or decision making function that is within the PMO. I understand. That's helpful. Um, you mentioned risk. So can I infer from that answer that the, the PMO is going to own the, the, the risk register going forward? The JPB will own the, the risk register. Yeah, but, but, but they'll be responsible for, for maintaining it. Yes. Right. Yes. Can, I, can I just return to the question, therefore, in terms of costs and benefits? I mean, Ernst & Young are going to be substantially responsible for, for uh, resourcing PMO, as I understand it. Or, well, you can correct me on that point. Yes, of but, but, but it, 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 it dawns on me that they are accountants. If Ernst & Young are in, in place, are they not well placed in order to, to provide an accurate cost-benefit analysis or business case, whatever we want to call it or describe it? So um, the PMO will be led by um, a Scottish government um, member of staff. Um, Ernst & Young will continue to provide advice um, as and when. But one of the things that we were, um, as SROs, very keen to do was to make sure that the agency is responsible for the implementation of integration um, were very much involved and in a leadership role of taking forward the programme. So we have made a change to the way that the PMO will work. It will not be led by Ernst & Young. Ernst & Young, um, and we haven't, as Tom McMahon said, we haven't concluded their role going forward. We're very conscious that they are an expensive resource and we're very conscious that they um, are, they have, they have a great skill set that they can offer to us. Um, but we also, as um, civil servants and public servants, have a great deal of skill to offer um, this integration process. So just based on that answer, it, it was, was uh, Mr McMahon's answer correct that nobody has done or is going to uh, conclude uh, cost-benefit analysis or business case. That's a bit of work that's just not going to take place. The work that was done as part of the passage of the bill 
um, made the case for integration of BTP. Um, there were a range of debates that took place at that time, and um, the thing that we are charged with taking forward is the implementation of integration. As we go along, we will expect that any options that are brought forward um, as part of the work streams um, will be subject to cost-benefit analysis. So, for example, if there are options around ICT, if there are options around workforce planning, we will expect them to be subject to cost-benefit analysis. Did you want to add anything? No, I think that's entirely correct. I, so, essentially, I'm, I'm very conscious that a number of decisions were made in 2014, 2015, 2016, um, which essentially were about the principle of, of devolution, and those arguments were set out at that time. What we're conscious of is both on the individual implementation cost-benefit issues that we want to make sure that we've properly reflected those. We also do think that we need to more accurately capture the benefits through a better benefits realisation process. So we do think there is work to do in that sort of area, but we haven't effectively revisited the, the fundamental question with the cost-benefits analysis because we see that fundamentally as a political decision which was made some time ago. Can I make a, a small point that a business case doesn't necessarily need to consider options or be about optionality. It can simply be about projecting costs against baseline and making sure that as, uh, as things are implemented that, that, that those costs are in line with, with projection. And both, both the understanding of what projected costs will be and baseline costs as compared to the as-is scenario with BTP is important. I just want to establish, is that a a piece of work that's going to be uh, undertaken or not, and, and if it's not, can I suggest that n not having a clear view of what you expect the cost to be going mm -hmm. forward would be a, a concern for me, certainly. Okay, sorry, perhaps I've misunderstood you. I think Tom McMahon probably referred to the point that you make around having a clear understanding of current costs and then a clear understanding of costs going forward, and Police Scotland, along with us, have committed to making sure that we are aware of the costs going forward. And, and when will that be concluded as a, as a, a piece of work? Because it, and, and will that be concluded before the integration programme is reinitiated from its current pause status? As I've said, the, the work continues on the integration activity um, because a lot of the activity that requires to be done is um, activity on um, mapping workforce activity, considering um, terms and conditions. So that, that does continue. As we go through the replanning process, we will have a sounder understanding of the costs going forward, and we would expect to have a stronger sense um, of, of what the ongoing costs will be. I mean, I think they may be subject to change depending on a whole range of factors, so it will be a dynamic assessment that we will continue to consider. What, what, sorry, what does a dynamic assessment mean? Well, costs may change. So, for example, we may have um, a, a different pay policy in th you know, the future. There may be um, different terms and conditions. We just need to think quite carefully about what those things those, those, are, those, those are all unknown. variables within your control. Yeah, but and surely those, those are exactly the sorts of things that you need to lock down yes. before you proceed. So therefore, once those things are locked down, the business case, certainly from those examples you give, shouldn't alter. There will, however, so there will un be unknown factors that we will um, have to manage as we go along. But we would expect by the end of the replanning process that we will have a sound understanding of costs. And those unknown factors, would you not expect to range so that you'd at least have a yes, best would, case? Yes, of course. I would just suggest that you'd want those projections in yeah. those cases in place before the integration green button was, was pressed. Is that not the case? Well, I think the decision for integration has already been made. Um, what so it's we, carry on regardless what, of the costs? What we are charged with is making sure that integration happens in the best way possible so that the safety of the travelling public is assured so that we have um, a service that is effective and meets the needs of um, all of the people who are involved in it. Um, obviously, costs will be a clear issue for us and for um, ministers and we will want to minimise those and we will work very hard to do that. I'll leave it there, Kabina. Yeah, if I could... 
perhaps return to the governance model. I think it's probably kind to say it's complex. You know, so far it seems as clear as mud. So, could I ask you to explain just exactly? We've got the joint programme board. We've got the mobilisation, transition, and transformation board, and we've got the programme management officer. Who are the accountable officers at each stage there? Do you want to? Yeah. So. I think it, it, it does sound complex, and one of the things we've tried to do is to evolve the model over the last year or so to effectively reduce some of the complexity. So the MTT was a really important initiative, which was really helpful in getting into some of the operational detail, but we now think that we need a different model, which essentially means that that's why we brought together the programme management office which will involve all parties and that will stand down the MTT so there's a clear as a implementation body and the joint program board sits above that as the decision making body with clear accountabilities to ministers but to be absolutely clear about this the accountability the buck stops with myself and with Donna throughout the entirety of the program clearly we will have to make sure that our ministers are clear about where things are that we'll have to advise them appropriately, but the buck, the buck in the programme stops with us. And yes, there will be individual work stream leads who are responsible for individual items, but they're accountable to the joint programme board and as such accountable to us for effective delivery. So where does the Scottish Government fit in? So the Scottish ministers are um, ultimately responsible for the um, integration and the... Um, enactment of the legislation. The Scottish Government is, um, because this is a joint programme, we are jointly responsible for the delivery of it. And that's all aspected, the delegated lead strategic responsibility for all aspects of railway policing integration to Police Scotland lies with both of you. So Sorry. I so yes, I think fundamentally the Joint Programme Board is the decision-making body. Um, so fundamentally the decisions are taken at the Joint Programme Board. Uh, by the same degree, we are both civil servants. So ultimately we advise our ministers on the issues that are coming to the Joint Programme Board and they have to take a view. Most particularly, as the committee's heard this morning, there are financial issues which have a, a cost. There are... Uh, operational issues which have a cost. There are parliamentary and legislative issues which have a cost. Essentially, the Joint Programme Board takes the decisions, but in doing so, obviously, we consult with ministers. Ministers, alt and we, we go to the Joint Programme Board with the decisions of ministers with us. Mm -hmm. So I think I would see this as a... So I would just draw the distinction, convener, if I may, between essentially we're responsible for the implementation. So we take the decisions or we take ministerial decisions and we ensure that they're implemented throughout the programme. But fundamentally, these involve political choices and ministers are fundamentally responsible for those mm -hmm. political choices, those strategic questions and choices through the programme. OK, that's helpful. Liam Kerr. In the earlier session, you heard me ask Police Scotland about... I just want to return to Daniel Johnson's cost-benefit analysis for me. Uh, you heard me ask Police Scotland uh, whether they were going to do the cost-benefit analysis they, they had undertaken to do at a previous meeting. I got two answers which are rather long, both of which I think distilled down to no. What's your understanding of that? Do you expect a cost-benefit analysis from Police Scotland as they undertook to do? Well, I think I've already made some comment on this. As the programme goes forward, I will expect cost-benefit analysis to be undertaken on each of the options um, as they emerge. Um, I expect that we, and as clarified by Mr Johnson, I expect that we will have a sound understanding of the costs which um, will emerge as part of the programme so that we can compare those with any baseline costs that we may be able to discern. And if the costs on any of those, if you like, bite-sized pieces, if the costs outweigh the benefits, then will anything change? And who makes that decision? Well, I think by the, I suppose the, the case that was made as part of the Railway Policing Bill suggested that the benefits would um, be substantial. Um, and I suppose it will be um, something that we will need to consider going forward as to, um, we're, we're doing a huge amount of work on benefits at the moment. Um, and 
we will consider that as we go along. If the costs in one or more of those assessments outweigh the benefits, is it possible to change the end game of the, the overall programme? And if so, who would make that decision? As I've explained, we are implementing government policy, which is the policy for full integration of BTP into Police Scotland. So the analysis... So regardless of the cost, Mr Johnson's point was correct, regardless, if the costs outweigh the benefit, nevertheless the end game remains the same. The discussion um, that we are having at the moment is about the options within the programme. Uh, what uh, independent assurance of the overall project will you be taking out with the Joint Programme Board? So we have planned for a gateway review um, later in the year. We plan to have um, a gateway just after the replanning exercise has um, completed to ensure that the programme is in good shape. Uh, and who will undertake forward. that, please? Well, we have um, within Scottish Government a centre of expertise who run um, gateway review programmes and they will um, engage with external um, independent assessors who will come in and um, who will gateway review our programme. Now, <coughs> just switching the focus, if I may, just for mm -hmm. a second. Uh, on the 20th of February of this year, the, there was a joint programme board meeting, a special joint programme board meeting, uh, at which the commission service model was discussed and I understand it was rejected. Uh, given the costs and, and risks that have been identified today, uh, can you explain to me why it was just rejected outright? Uh, why it wouldn't be explored further? And why it wouldn't be explored as perhaps a, a transition model? I mean, might it be a better solution to, to, to think instead of just one end game, think how do we get there using a, a, a more innovative model perhaps? Just on that particular joint programme board, so I was there in, in attendance for that particular broad board meeting. I think it's important to emphasise that the joint programme board as a whole didn't effectively say no to the commission model because essentially that wasn't really within the gift of the joint programme board. I think this comes back to fundamentally the political choice with respect to integration remains a political choice for Scottish ministers and into that project board, we raised the question, is there, a, is there a change in direction or is there a potential change in direction? And it was made very, very clear that there wasn't such a change in direction. And I know that Mr. Matheson made that subsequently very, very clear as well. So I think it is really important to emphasize that the joint program board didn't effectively sort of rule this out. Fundamentally, that question remains a question for the Scottish government. But the joint program board will have to deliver it, the Joint Programme Board has no locus to say this appears to be not the ideal solution or this will not necessarily deliver the solution. Uh, is there another way to skin the cat? The so, JPB has no locus to say that. Uh, the JPB provides advice to ministers. So if we um, were in a position where we thought that any of the issues were insoluble um, or any of the issues were... Um, that we couldn't work through, we would provide that advice to ministers. But that is not a position that we are in at the present time. Absolutely. Uh, one final question, if I may. The uh, committee has received various submissions uh, uh, about various aspects of this process. And one is from uh, uh, Dr Murray, uh, who states that analysis suggests the current policy direction doesn't reflect best value. And best value is a defined term uh, against an Audit Scotland uh, description. Uh, so on that, do you, as the JPB, uh, have a view on whether full integration provides best value as defined by Audit Scotland? So the points that Kath Murray makes um, do not reflect the fact that we have a settled government policy position on this, which is full integration. Um, they seek to reopen um, considerations um, about other options. The approach that we have taken to best value as a, a programme board has, to be, has been to consider Audit Scotland's um, work on best value, um, particularly around partnerships. So we've sought to put in place clear leadership, which is a result of the, um, the governance changes that we've made. 
um, with clear lines of accountability. Um, we have sought to put in place arrangements around joint planning, which are incredibly important in a programme of this nature, uh, complexity and size. Effective use of joint resources, which is another area which we have much work to do uh, going forward. Um, and I think the evidence from the panel that you received um, in the last session um, was a great illustration of that. And then sound processes to monitor and report on the achievement of outcomes. And the MTT, as part of their work, we're beginning to think of the transformation work going forward. So that is the activity that we have put in place to ensure that as part of our programme delivery, we will have um, a best value approach to delivery. Thank you. Can I press you a little bit further just on the, the case for detailed evidence and analysis? A full business case was ruled out. Um, instead, there was a BRIA business regulatory impact assessment. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that was wildly optimistic as to um, just how this would play out. Given they have now all these increased costs, the un uncertainty of the final cost, value for money, concerns, and, and the risks in so many different aspects, would it seem reasonable that, that you suggested to ministers who should be a full business case now carried out to provide that evidence-based analysis as opposed to assertion, which is largely what we've, we've had so far in the full integration programme? So I would, I would put it in two ways. So I think, um, first of all, within the context of the decision with respect to full integration, so the political decision, I think the role of the Joint Programme Board is to, to properly raise issues with ministers in exactly the way that we did in February, where there was a material issue which we thought would impact upon uh, passenger safety in that particular instance. We raised it with ministers. As Donna said, if there are issues which come out of the process, cost escalations or areas like that, we would again expect to raise that uh, with ministers. And I would say one of the things we're trying to do through the joint programme arrangements, through the improved joint programme arrangements, are to effectively ensure that we have a tighter grip across the entirety of the programme. So our, our approach is effectively to manage the implementation in an effective as manner as we possibly can and to raise broader issues to ministers, but we don't see that as going as far as sort of effectively establishing as were a full evidence, a full business case type scenario, um, because fundamentally the decision remains one for ministers. If I could press you on Please that, a tighter grip, um, but is that the same as having detailed evidence that can then be analysed? Because that's really what we, we need. So, and, and can I just give the committee absolutely clear reassurance on this? Even where we are at the, the moment on this project, I wouldn't say that there was absolutely detailed evidence on every individual aspect, but there has been extensive work underway on aspects of detail. We've heard a bit about uh, pensions. We've heard uh, information about terms and conditions, we've heard about cross-border policing issues, and one impression that I really wouldn't want the committee to take from the pause process mm -hmm. is that we're progressing this project in any other way than based upon evidence and analysis coming to us. That's now, there's a very specific evidential question that you've put to us, which is essentially uh, we're managing essentially the cost implications, but I really don't want the committee to think that the JPB at each of its monthly or six weekly meetings isn't taking very detailed papers, details accounts, which look at financial costs, which look at operational impacts, which look at material issues in order that we can take informed decisions. I, I think that the particular, the particular evidential question that you raise, however, is, is not something that we would propose to look at as a JPB. Well, that causes me some difficulty mm. because the Scottish Government, we've heard in evidence from the previous panel, led the engagement prior to the bill being passed, mm. but we've now heard from the first panel that engagement has been practically non-existent. Now, if you're looking for the detail yeah. and the analysis and one side isn't being fully engaged, it's not going to happen, is it? There is a problem. Yeah. Do you want so I, I, I'd be happy just to go on to the engagement question in particular, because mm. I absolutely agree with you that the basic model convener of this process was that the ones with the greatest level of specialism, 
the ones with the information to hand should be leading the process. And if you look at, for example, on questions of assets and liabilities, that doesn't suffer a lack of detail. There's a considerable amount of, of detailed information, which is coming through what has been extensive engagement. Uh, now, I think there is a particular engagement question with respect to officers and staff, where I think there is absolutely, and we say this in our letter quite squarely to the committee, that we think there is further, further work to do. I do think there has been slightly more engagement than perhaps you've heard to date, and we could effectively go through quite a number of workshops, discussions, meetings, which effectively were an attempt to engage, um, and uh, as well as the question and answer that we published last year, which effectively went through a number of issues. But I absolutely accept there is more work to do in that staff and officer engagement area. But in terms of the actual engagement within the joint programme arrangements to date, the access to information, the access to information, the involvement of the various parties, I think that's good, but we think we need to get it even better through the more through the joint programme arrangements. So again, I don't want the committee to be left with the impression that essentially a vigorous and robust evidence-based discussion isn't happening to date. There's detailed engagement, extensive engagement. Uh, we just recognise that we need to do even more. Yeah. Please. address what the BT uh, PF told us that they'd submitted over 70 questions to the Scottish Government and they remain unanswered uh, apart from just you know three main principles that they keep repeating yeah. the whole time. Um, I'm happy to pick up on that um, and I think Dan's absolutely right. Um, I'm, I was surprised to hear from Nigel Goodbad that there had been no engagement for quite some time. Um, officials have met with the BTPF on 13th, 14th, 15th of December, the 9th of January, the 20th, 21st, 22nd of February, uh, for full day workshops to consider terms and conditions and other matters that are um, ongoing. Um, there are a number of questions that remain unanswered um, and we are working to um, find the answers to them and find solutions. Um, I think Dan is absolutely right in that we need to um, improve our engagement with, um, with staff, with officers um, and with stakeholders more broadly. Um, I have put in place a communications and engagement lead within the programme team to take that work forward and I expect that we will have um, a programme of work on comms and engagement which will be presented to the JPB on the 8th of May. So I expect that we will have a full schedule for the rest of the year by that point. Absolutely. And we would expect those 73 questions to be answered as part of that process and one of the reasons, convener, just to be absolutely clear why the questions weren't answered as effectively they came to us before the replanning exercise and the replanning exercise has a particular impact on those. So what we wanted to do, and we thought this was actually the best way and the most effective way to engage was to essentially to roll them into the replanning exercise, which I absolutely agree needs, and I think this is where Nigel had a particularly strong point, where we need to be more visible on the replanning exercise than we are at the moment. And that's exactly as Donna says, one of the issues that will be taken at the 8th of May, JPB, as to how we can make the replanning of this project as inclusive as we can possibly make it. And Yes. One other thing that I would add is that we absolutely take on board Callum Steele's points about getting the human factors of this programme right. Um, we have focused quite a lot on the technical matters and the legislative matters, but I think having um, a, a comms and engagement strategy that will put people at the heart of this will make a big difference to the way people feel about the programme and how, how it's taken forward. Well, I think it's absolutely germane if you, you're going to progress in any sex yes. successful that people in the organisation mm -hmm come first and, and must be consulted first. And it has been quite alarming this morning just how the human aspect had been left very much to, to the end of the, the process. Not a criticism of you, uh, it was um, obviously how it was set out in the, the legislation. Uh, or as passed, Daniel. So I just want to ask a, a brief supplementary about the, the gateway assessment that you, mm. you, you mentioned a while ago now. Um, could you just clarify when that assessment is, is likely to take place? Is that essentially going to serve as the conclusion of the, 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 the replanning? And could you maybe just uh, outline what documentation will be submitted uh, as part of that? And I'm, I'm assuming that goes before the, the, the JPB 
And will that include yeah. the sort of some of the, the, the cost analysis, cost projections, business case, whatever you want to call it? Uh, so if you just said, when will that be yeah. and what will it consist of? Yes, um, the gateway process is a fairly standard process within government and public sector. Um, and um, we expect that once we have completed the repanning um, phase, we will um, undertake a gateway review at that stage to ensure that the programme is fit for purpose going forward. Um, at that stage, we would expect to have um, the, the full suite of documents that would go along with a programme, which would include um, the um, programme plan document, the um, PPD. Um, you would, and associated with that would be things like the vision, the blueprint, and the target operating model, model for the, um, the work going forward. Um, so I would expect to have a full suite of programme documentation at that time. And, and when will that take place, sorry? That will take place at the end of the replanning exercise, which we expect to be at probably around the end of August. Okay, thank you. Uh, ben? <coughs> yeah, I should say. Uh, I just wanted to touch on the pensions issue that I raised mm. with, with the previous panel. As far as I can recall, uh, at stage one of the legislation, uh, the uh, SPA stated that there were two options that were possible uh, for um, existing BTP officers from Scotland to either uh, stay in the British Transport Police Force Superannuation Fund or for the, the option that seems to have been uh, now chosen, which was to uh, maintain membership of the, that fund, but on a segregated basis, transferring the BTP officers and staff in Scotland out of the main pot and into a segregated pot, but a closed scheme. I just want, wanted to get some clarity on when and why those those decisions were made uh, as to what preference was, was chosen. So, um, just rewinding back, so you're entirely right, Mr McPherson, there were a range of options that were available. Um, at an earlier stage in this process. So, and, and this does go back to the human point, which we've heard a considerable amount of, and quite rightly so, in that the Joint Programme Board last year um, did think about essentially a number of areas where it wanted to preserve continuity, precisely to provide the sort of reassurances to officers and staff that we thought were really important. And I, I think there is a bit sometimes of a, a point of, of characterising some of the work of the Joint Programme Board as legislative and technical, when fundamentally it is about trying to give some degree of assurance on some of those questions to, um, to officers and staff. Um, so what we did in the summer of last year is we effectively made what I think is a really important decision, that is essentially an as-is transfer decision. So there are a range of options um, prior to that which essentially said we can transfer in a range of different ways. But what we tried to do over summer is to clarify that a number of aspects of um, terms and conditions would remain transferred across, ranging from pay, ranging from allowances, uh, ranging from the dual status that British Transport Police officers um, currently enjoy. So there are a range of things that came across. One of those was essentially in relation to pensions. So what we've done over the course of the last several months is to engage with the trustees of the pension arrangements to effectively work out the most effective means for a transfer on an as-is basis, i.e. remaining members of the railway pension scheme would work. And following actuarial advice, the segregated scheme was the most appropriate way to effectively execute that. But in doing so, it is really important. Again, one word that we keep on using in the process is as is. We are ensuring as part of this process that uh, pensioners or prospective pensioners have the same terms and conditions, which is exactly why um, Tom talked to you about things like, for example, the discussion with respect to indemnity. So we thought as an actuarial and a practical matter, the segregated scheme was the, not just the most appropriate, I think from a legal perspective, I think there are challenges with anything else. But in doing so, we were trying to ensure continuity of terms and conditions. Have your discussions with the trustees of the scheme been constructive so They've far? They've been highly constructive, yeah. highly constructive. So I think Nigel's quite right to say that effectively we haven't decided points, but the level of engagement and the constructive and collaborative nature of that engagement from the trustees has been most helpful. Thank you.
Thank you. Just on the terms and conditions, again, at last panel, it was brought up while the intention is there and the aim is there. There's nothing actually in writing to say this will be delivered, a cast iron guarantee. Will that be forthcoming? So I would uh, absolutely, convener. So the, I would draw two points here. So the first one is that we did try to provide some clarity on the 8th of December when we issued the Q&A to officers and staff. And I accept there is an element of conditionality, but we, we hoped that that was sufficiently clear that we were looking at continuity of terms and conditions. The, the real mechanism for that clarity is the legislation. Um, so, effectively, the legislation transfers officers and staff as they are. And that's the particular mechanism that we are, we are working through. And to be absolutely clear with the committee, in that legislation, it is as plain as day that we're talking about in as is. And if this provides some assurance to, to Nigel and to others, um, it's absolutely the case that that legislation has been advanced entirely on that basis. There's no, here's no, lots of square brackets saying add, add in here. Mm -hmm. That's the basis upon which it works. But the legislation is the critical, critical tool. And ideally, um, we, were, we, we considered, convener, we were in a position to uh, complete the legislation in the early part of this year so it could be introduced when the 1st of April 2019 timescale was in operation. We engaged in a short pause of that legislation in order to make sure it fit with the replanning exercise, but we would still like to complete the, the legislation as far as we possibly can by summer. And then I can give an absolute uh, assurance to, 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 to Nigel, um, to Tessa, and to the other organizations that we'll want to be showing them that legislation as quickly as we possibly can to provide them some of the reassurance that they want. Would you be prepared to put in writing that this, these terms and conditions will be guaranteed? So, I'm, on an as-is basis, I, I have no reservation about that, so my answer would be yes. Okay, I think that would certainly supply some assurance. Liam Kerr? But, Kavita, I apologise. Could I just make one point there? So, it will be at transfer, but inevitably, um, as with any, any arrangement over a period of time, um, terms and conditions can be negotiated, can be changed, but at the point of transfer, those terms and conditions will be maintained. I think putting exactly what's an offer in writing and that commitment to do it will be very helpful and will move us on. Just to develop that point, uh, Mr Goodban said earlier that the uh, status of the British Transport Police currently, they have employment status. Police Scotland are Crown employees. They, they do not have employment status mm. as such within law. So, uh, and there won't actually be a transfer as such, I, I think I'm right in saying. There will not be a Tupi transfer because uh, you're not becoming an employee, you're becoming a Crown uh, officer. Uh, so how can it be? You, you, you must, mm. if you stop being an employee and become a Crown officer, you lose employment rights, don't you? So they won't cease being an employee. So this is a really important point. So under the, the COSOP arrangements, you're right that it's not a TUPI transfer, it's a COSOP transfer, but essentially they will enjoy dual status as uh, constables and employees when they uh, enter the service. So they will Scotland. become part of Police Scotland, but are not part of Police Scotland. They will retain a... a, a so there are of new transferees in because the... the uh, mm. Police Scotland, we heard earlier, will have to transfer people in to cover any gaps. Uh, I'm paraphrasing now, I appreciate. But they will have officer status and they'll be joining a unit that has employment status. So you're entirely right. There are issues to work out here, not in relation to the transfer. To be absolutely clear, they will be tr the dual status has been uh, determined. But you're absolutely right, there are operational implications. There are actually quite a number of operational implications as to what that means. And that's exactly why one of the most important strands of the work that we want to do as part of the replanning exercise is this operational aspect. There are quite, quite simply tens of complex operational questions that we need to resolve over the course of the next two years. Yes, but and it makes it rather difficult, Mr Moore, for you to, to say, guaranteed, we will preserve terms and conditions, when quite clearly, under employment law, I don't, I, I'm questioning whether you no, can no. give that commitment. So I'm, I am saying, I, I hope as plainly as I can that the United Kingdom government 
and this is a position that's agreed with the Scottish Government in the legislation, in the Section 90 order, which will be the relevant legal instrument, we'll execute an as-is transfer in relation to terms and conditions. I think, uh, Mr. Kerr, what you're quite reasonably raising is there are a number of operational implications, and I think Mr. Goodman could reasonably raise those as well, and those are absolutely, to be sure, the issues that we will be working through, but I have no reservation in making the commitment I've just made. Thank you. Just to clarify a point that uh, Mr. Kerr raised again there, and Mr. Goodman said an, an error, uh, repeated an error, and that is, it's right to say that Serving police officers in police, police Scotland are not Crown servants, they're public servants. It's yeah. a different status no, again. I, 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 just, I just wonder, in relation to a, a couple of points, if I may convene, and that is, as things stand at the moment with Police Scotland, and this will be mirrored presumably in other forces, there are a range of terms and conditions that yes. apply, not least, <coughs> excuse me, in respect of pensions. I wonder, Mr Moore or, or, or Ms Bell, um, yeah, I'm a former police officer. I've served with people who've transferred from the British Transport Police. There must be experience on an individual basis of what's happened in relation to particularly pensions, I think, and there will have been transfers mm. in both directions. Is there anything that can be learned from that? Could it be scaled up? Um, I appreciate it's a very difficult thing. I, I, People Absolutely. used to take their pensions with them, and then sometimes they didn't. So, um, just a quick point on then after. So, from the United <coughs> Kingdom perspective, we have a, a, a very reasonable degree of experience in these questions. So, uh, within the Department of Transport, there are a number of individuals who have been transferred from other organisations, like, for example, the Strategic Rail Authority. So, the lawyers who are involved, from our perspective, in those questions are absolutely... Uh, taken advantage of that previous experience and the broader government experience of transfers. As you're very well aware, Mr Finney, that these sort of transfers are not unusual in many respects. They're, they're things which are they're not quite the bread and butter of government, but there are considerable numbers each year. So we absolutely are making, making, making full, full, uh, uh, full advantage of those as a previous experience. I think you also raise a very sensible point, a very reasonable point, if I may say so, in relation to um, the fact that there are a range of existing terms and conditions which are effectively are across both Police Scotland and, for that matter, for the British Transport Police. And that's exactly why I think we're on maybe day nine of a number of workshops which are very much intended to get to the bottom of all of those terms and conditions so that we can absolutely execute the as-is transfer when we, when we need to do so. But this is, again, some of the complexity of this process, uh, convener, that essentially there is a lot of detail. There is a lot more going on than perhaps I think may have been anticipated at the start of this process. Can I perhaps confirm who has responsibility for the risk register now that MTT has been disbanded? The GPB. That's you. Take yeah. it home. Take uh, it home. And could now that Ernst and Young has been brought in to 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 play, um, I think you you said yourself, Ms. Bell, it was a, an expensive commodity. Can you give an outline of some of the costs that have been accrued so far from their involvement and the projected costs from their involvement? Tom McMahon, I think, gave you um, a rundown of the costs that have already been incurred, um, and we have yet to conclude um, Ernst and Young's ongoing um, role. In the programme. So could, could you just for the record state what they, they are? The costs that were that have been incurred already? Yes. Yeah, I have it here. So um, £400,000 for the um, programme change management and um, I recall that Tom also mentioned another cost. I'm sorry I don't have that written in front of me. So you give Mr Scott a a full rundown of that and we can respond in writing if that's helpful and is it the case that it isn't really possible to predict the future cost given there isn't an end date for um for full integration for ernst and young or for the program in ernst and young we will ha reach some conclusions about ernst, ernst and young's involvement in the program going forward by the end of the replanning process so to be clear four hundred thousand has been paid to date four hundred thousand i believe is um to engage Ernst and Young as part to April 2019. Um, but I would need to check that, whether that is a Police Scotland cost that's been incurred. And will there be additional costs um, over and above the engagement costs? We haven't decided that yet. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I would say, uh, convener, that 
uh, one of the things we've tried to do, in, so A, we're focused very much on getting this right. And I think as a practical matter, and I, I, I echo the comments of Mr. Matteson um, a couple of months ago when, when the effect of, when, when, we, when, we, when we paused and when we changed the date, that's not something that anybody wanted to be in a position to do. But what we've effectively said now is that we will really make sure that the replanning exercise works in the right sort of way to build the level of commitment to get a particular date. And I think that includes two levels of resource. It's both the sort of project support resource that Ernst & Young have very, very genuinely, very helpfully provided to date. But also, I think there's a considerable amount, as Donna was mentioning earlier, of civil service and broader organisational support that we'll be using. I think one of our lessons, and we hold our hand up to this, is that uh, we needed to devote a greater level of dedicated resources to this project than was the case in the early stage. And that, unfortunately, in, in, in imposes a cost, but it will be a cost that will be monitored by the Joint Programme Board as we progress. No, I understand fully why they've been brought in, but given a lot of the, the costs are going to be coming out of the reform budget, which is there to try and ensure that Police Scotland operates effectively, which is a huge challenge in itself, then this is a very important question. Mm. Um, Daniel. I just want to clarify some of those points. So we've got a £400,000 engagement cost for Ernst Young, a £300,000 cost in terms of financial due diligence. We heard from Mr McMahon that they had, their initial assessment was that there was a, a million pound opportunity cost for Police Scotland. What was the, A, would you uh, recognise those figures I've, I've just listed? And secondly, what was both the Scottish Government and UK Government's initial assessments on, again, their opportunity cost, their cost of, 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 of allocating people to this programme, and what is your current assessment of, of what that cost would be? Those costs are costs that have been made available to the JPB in the past, so yes, they are recognisable. Um, certainly, Scottish Government has um, put in place, we have put in place a team to um, take forward the integration programme, um, which includes the um, membership of the programme management office, um, and also um, to include people to work on the legislative aspects of that. Um, so there is, I, I don't have a, a full ongoing cost until the replanning process has taken place, um, but we can um, record that as part of the documentation that will be made available at the point of the gateway review. And from the United Kingdom perspective, um, we uh, specifically um, allocate a small number of staff costs associated with this particular um, a project, uh, a relatively small number of uh, two, two staff members who were responsible for it, and also the British Transport Police included within its medium-term financial plan particular costs that are associated with essentially planning the, the process. And I hope you'll forgive me, I think from recall it was uh, £500,000 for uh, 2017, 18 and 2018-19, and I, I'm happy to confirm that directly with the committee because I just have to review again the medium-term financial plan. So those things were included, but I do, we don't shrink away from this. I, there is an additional cost here, and we are absolutely, as a joint programme board, are very concerned both about the public money aspect, but also we're very conscious that this also impacts upon the railway operators. And that's one of the reasons, for example, why the UK government has made it very clear to the British Transport Police Authority through specific grant conditions that we've imposed that we'd expect that cost to be minimised to the greatest extent possible. But I, I don't think we can shrink away from this. It is going to cost more. The replanning exercise is the means by which we effectively establish um, what that looks like and the improved prog programme and project management arrangements that we've talked the committee through today are the means by which we monitor that and ensure that it remains uh, reasonable. So, so just on the basis of, of all of that, we're, we're looking at something like uh, in the region of a, uh, around a, a million pounds of additional cost just from Ernst & Young. And, and within the, the, the scheme of things, that sounds like it, there's approximately a million pounds um, allocated from Police Scotland, something similar from combined civil service resource. So it, it, in rough terms, you're looking at something that is at the very least a 20% cost increase, could be as much as 50%, and that's before you've looked at additional civil service uh, costs in terms of increasing allocated resource. Is that, would that be a, 
a, a fair sort of summary? I, I'd be reluctant to be mm. unduly precise, but yeah, I, I don't think that's an unfair summary of the implications of the additional work that we we feel that we need to do to get this right. And I think it is really important then to count up, to set that against effectively the costs of getting this wrong with respect to both the, the staff costs, mm. the financial costs that could be associated with getting it wrong, and we think this is a reasonable investment. But to be sure, absolutely to be sure, we are looking to try to minimise that, that additional cost to the greatest extent possible. But, but neither are you able to say how much more the programme is going to cost. But, but that's not right. because of effectively... So, Mr Johnson, to be absolutely, again... Uh, it's not because we're effectively looking to, to not be frank with mm -hmm. the committee. It's because we want to make sure the replanning exercise works. So I, Donna and I are very open in the next couple of months to the British Transport Police and others saying, well, actually, in order to make this work, in order to hit a date that we're committed to, this is what we feel that we will need. Um, and... Yes, we will interrogate that and we will scrutinise that, but that's the process. And what we don't want to do is to not prejudge it, not for any sort of technical point, but we don't want to prejudge it because we want it to be an effective process. And that's why we want it to also be a quick process. So we do this by the end of August, we have clarity, and then we monitor against that clarity. And I think we'd be in a position at that stage to be clearer with the committee about what we think the additional costs are. So, so we don't know what implementation is going to cost. We don't even know what the programme to carry out the implementation is going to cost. That's the current situation, isn't it? Uh, that, that is the replanning exercise, and that, that will um, help us to better understand the costs. You have already had evidence from Tom McMahon that sets out the costs thus far, and um, certainly I can respond in writing to the committee if that would be helpful on costs incurred by the government thus far. So that concludes our question. Look forward to the additional information you've undertaken to provide. Um, I wonder if you could set out the, the new government, given the governance arrangement has been reviewed, if you could submit the new arrangement with the accountable yes. officers, that would be very helpful to the committee. And it only remains for me to thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you very much indeed. We, that concludes the public part of today's meeting. Our next meeting will be on 8th May when the committee will commence its stage one scrutiny of the management of offenders bill. And we now move into private session. And I suspend briefly to allow witnesses to leave and the public gallery to clear. <laughs>